Welcome back to my channel. Okay, let's get right into it. In my research into St. Corona, I've come to realize that she represents the Christian overlay of the ancient mother goddess worship, particularly of Karna and Cardea, the white goddess. Through her, the medical priesthood wields the knowledge of disease control, the power to heal and inflict p plague. The name Corona encodes the spell of incorporation through the enchantment of Latin, the language of the hidden one. Hospitals, churches, and banks are all related through the corporation. Throughout this coronavirus pandemic, one theme has predominated, stay out of hospitals at all cost, because it's the protocols that will kill you. Are they the contemporary temples of human sacrifice? We'll have a look at the etymology of the word hospital to discern the relationship of hospitality to the corporation. We'll examine, too, the keys of Janus and Kybel and how they came to be in the hands of the Pope, the head of the Roman Catholic Corporation. This entire COVID-19 travesty appears to be a giant Jesuit ritual. To me, it's an ancient amorphic priesthood of many hats. The medical priests of the white coat, the therapeutae, throughout their fake history, from Mesopotamia to the Hospitallers to the Knights of Malta today, finally will demonstrate that the source of their sorcery, the Madha, or medical knowledge of this priesthood, is based in Chthonic goddess worship, that is, the goddess of the earth or the underworld. The priests of the white coat worship the white goddess. So here's the etymology of corporation, persons united in a body for some purpose, the assumption of a body, corporare, embodied to make or fashion into a body, corpus, dead body, animal body, a guild, legally authorized entity, artificial person created from by law from a group or succession of persons. Now before we move on, um, I'd like to point out that one researcher, Engoods, pointed out that Corona means the worship of Mary, and it is rather obvious now. Saint Corona represents the worship of Mary, the cult of the Great Mother, or the White Goddess. Maritime law, which is what we are living under, and it is of the Jesuits. As we already know, the official Jesuit monogram, IHS, where the solar symbol for Saturn is subtly stylized to appear as an H. However, Jesuit Athanasius Kircher secretly reveals this entire time the official Jesuit monogram of IHS never contained the letter H within it, but was more akin to the letter C, which he reveals stands for the word Corona. This is the video in question that I'm talking about by N. Goods. It's an excellent listen. The Delta variant is the Jesuit priesthood. The Egyptian priests of the Nile, Freemasonry defines Delta as the Jesuit IHS, which Athanasius Kircher explains Isis, Corona, Serapis, and is the Jesuit Ratio Studiorum. Ignatian pedag pedagogical paradigm, which is the basis of masonry. Maskers and Baxers are dead Catholic converts triangulated by Rome. I'll be getting into this in my next series of videos, but I just wanted to point it out here. Delta is the master-slave relationship of the Jesuit superior to the masker Baxer slave. Athanasius Kircher uh, virtually invented ancient Egypt. It's all a hoax. Here is Harpocrates right here. And here is the triumph of Corona. Behold, wearing a mask, you are literally a dead Roman Catholic sex cadaver effigy, baby doll, figurine, puppet, mannequin, marionette, without an identity, soul, created by the Jesuits. 
you are incorporated. The ancient trinity of EAP, meaning Emhet, Amen, Horus, Osiris, and Ptah, which was later Hellenized by ancient Greece to IHS, meaning Isis, Harpocrates, and Serapis. <clears throat> and then finally, spuriously allegorized by the Jesuit order in Latin is ICS, meaning Intelligentsia Corona Serapis. So the coronavirus is the crowning glory of the Jesuit world order. And the Delta is the Jesuit order itself. Again, I'll be getting more into this later as it's quite difficult to uh, grasp right now for me. This is the uh, Tenebrae Hearse, the only triangulated implement in the Catholic liturgy. It also represents the Caries, the goddesses of violent death, the dark ones. Here is Harpocrates, Corona, Mary, the rod of Asclepius. And N. Goods explains that Aleister Crowley is really just a Jesuit priest. As I've already shown well back in March 7, 2020, the word virus is Latin for poison. Corona is the English name for the aura that surrounds the sun, the allegory of the Jesuit order, and it was taken from the Latin word used for inner circle, Kirche, Circe, Circus, Corona, Mary, of the Roman Catholic clergy that surrounds the altar. That is to say, coronavirus in English literally means the poison atmosphere encompassing the name of the Jesuit order that surrounds the sacrificial altar of Mary to the gods for the dead. So, the Jesuit order is the sun, Mary is the moon, together they are corona. Here is the sun pillar and the moon pillar of the Jesuits. Now back to corporation. The corporation was created by Justinian's corpus juris, the body of law, the language of the dead. Um... We have canon law, which is religious law, and civil law. The church is an ecclesiastical corporation. Ecclesiastical corporations are for spiritual purposes and religious property. Lay corporations are for secular business. There are two kinds of lay, the elemazonary, the charitable, and the civil for profit, hospitals, originally fell under the Elemazonary Corporation. The corporation is a legal entity authorized by state to act as a legal person for the persons or shareholders who own the entity. Like an individual person or corporation can enter into contracts, can sue and be sued, perform the actions necessary to carry on business. The shareholders or owners of the corporation are legally protected from personal liability. Hospitals are generally incorporated. Churches have a legal ex existence. The word church is said to mean in strictness not the material fabric, but the cure of souls, the right of tithes. It's a church, the, a church is a hospital for the soul. This is all in Black's Law Dictionary. The key. Uh, this is, we are incorporated through our birth certificate. And the bank is also a corporation, a form of hospitality which receives a guest. A church, a hospital, and bank are all based on the host-guest relationship of the cubiculum hospitalis, or guest chamber, all subject to the laws of hospitality. The duties of hospitality, the guest and the host, 
the institution for sick or wounded people is recorded by the 1540s. And that's exactly when the Jesuits were incorporated. Hostel, hotel, a shift in Latin from duties to buildings might have been via the common term cubiculum hospitalis, the guest chamber. So the etymology of hospitality, hospice meaning host, guest, stranger, from hostis, stranger or enemy, hostile. Hospital means guest chamber, guest lodgings, an inn. We have hostipotis, hostis, stranger, and potis, master. Strangers are potential enemies as well as guests. The word has a forked path. Guess means to eat. Gasati, or ga, to eat, to gorge, from where we get the word guest, or gustatory. Stranger, host, guest, enemy. We also get hostage and hostile from the hospital. So maybe the hosp hospitals are not such safe places. Host lies within the word hospital. We are the host in the parasitical hospital system. A host is a larger organism that harbors smaller organisms. Parasitic, guest, symbium. The parasitic worms, pathogenic, disease-causing viruses, all in the host. The black rat is a reservoir host for bubonic plague. Hostia also means human sacrifice. Hostia were the offering, usually an animal in sacrifice. Hostia is sacrificed before the battle. The victima is afterwards. The host to the hostiles, or enemy, hostis, and the victim to the victors. The uh, hostia were classified by age. The lactentes were young enough to be still taking milk. And the bidentes had reached two years of age. They had two longer incisor teeth, the dentes. So these are children, child sacrifice. Hostia is also the origin of the word for the Eucharistic host. Host comes from hostia, the communion bread, the lamb, the host, hostias, the sacrificial victim. Christian ritual of the Eucharist, Catholic, at the words of institution, the bread substance is changed into the body of Christ, the sacrificial victim. She is about to host the parasites. And here we have some implements that mark the host. We also get the heavenly host. In the book of Revelation, the rebellious forces of Satan are defeated by the heavenly host led by Michael, the archangel, during the war in heaven. The term heavenly host can refer broadly to all angelic beings, holy and unholy. And you will recall that St. Michael is Aldebaran. The tie of hospitality is Hospitium. The concept of hospitality, the divine right of guests, and the divine duty of the host has a twofold character, private and public. All strangers, without ex exception, were regarded as being under the protection of Zeus, Zeus Zenios, the god of strangers, and had the right to hospitality. After the stranger was clothed and entertained, no inquiry was made as to his name or antecedents until all duties of hospitality had been fulfilled. When the guest parted from his host, he was often presented with gifts, and sometimes a die, or a token, was broken between them. Each then took a part. A family connection was established, and the broken die served as a symbol of recognition. Thus the members of each family found in the other hosts and protectors in case of need. This die is called a tessera. 
violation by the host of the duties of hospitality provoked the wrath of the gods. In Rome, private hospitality was accurately and legally defined. The tie between host and guest was ex as strong as that between the patron and client. A contract was entered into, the clasping of hands and an exchange of agreement in writing, the tabula hospitalis, or of a token, tessera or symbol, rendered hereditary by the division of the tessera. The guest enjoyed the right of hospitality when traveling, and protection of his host in the court of law. The contract was sacred and inviolable, undertaken in the name of Jupiter Hospitalis. It's also a tile from Mosaics. The tessera is a token, a ticket, a tile, a tally, and they were evidence of your entitlement under Roman authority. Roman authority. If your birth was registered in Rome, you received a tessera issued by the state to obtain benefits, like today's birth certificate. They were a means of identification. The tiles were hereditary. When a stranger claimed hospitium, the tessera had to be produced for examination for authenticity. The same systems were used to provide government welfare. They were the original EBT card, tessera, a square or cube, a die, a token, a voucher, or a means of identification. The Roman Empire used tessera to identify slaves, soldiers, and citizens over 2,000 years ago. Tessera frumentiaria were tokens given to the poor in exchange for which they received a fixed amount of corn or money. We see the same concept in the movie The Hunger Games. We're going to have to get our own tessera in the upcoming famine, apparently, if we're not self-sufficient. The Roman government under Augustus issued tessera as proof of entitlement to grain doles. In Caligula's time, the people were provided with what is called a Greek karagma. State-issued karagmas were required to do business in the marketplace, to receive benefits as members of a system of korban that provided social welfare. The korban was um, compelled sacrifice. Those who paid into the emperor's system of korban received a certification that they were members of that system. Those who didn't have their proof of sacrifice to Caesar could be excluded from the marketplace. Identification was essential for enforcement. The Corban system was at the center of the Roman Christian conflict, as well as between Christ and the Pharisees. The mark or badge of the beast that proves you must bow down and serve the beast comes in many forms. You cannot buy or sell in the marketplace without your badge of service. Today, our badge of service is the vaccination card. The Greek term for mark is karagma, the brand a master places upon an animal or slave, the mark left by a serpent's bite. Engraved, etched, branded, or inscribed, mark or sign, the serpent's mark, its bite, its sting. Karagma is the mark of the beast, Greek word for mark, in Strong's Concordance, a scratch or etching, a badge of servitude, graven, finally, a mark. Direct related to, related to the Greek word karax, which means to sharpen to a point, also describes a stake. Yesterday's karagma is today's card. And here is the Strong's Concordance. And we'll see later that engraving is also the root word of graphene. We are being marked by the graphene today. Graphene in the in uh, vaccinations. Thus, the mark of the beast is a mark of loyalty and devotion to the beast on your forehead, your thoughts, or your right hand, your deeds.
And Tessera is also the name of a gene editing company. Hospitium, or Xenia in Greek, is the ritualized guest friendship, it was termed theoxenia when a god was involved. Here we have Mercury and Jupiter in the house of Philemon and Bacchus. In Ovid's tale of Bacchus and Philemon, they were an old married couple in Phrygia and the only ones in their town to welcome the disguised gods Zeus and Hermes, thus embodying the pious exercise of hospitality, the ritualized guest friendship termed Xenia. Offended because no one else welcomed them, <coughs> excuse me, Zeus and Hermes destroyed the town, but turned their humble cottage into a temple. The couple's wish to be guardians of the temple was granted. They were changed into intertwining pairs of trees, one oak and one linden. Theoxenia in the Bible The possibility that unidentified strangers in need of hospitality were gods in disguise in Acts 14, 11 through 12, relates the ecstatic rece reception given to Paul of Tarsus and Barnabas as they ministered in the city of Lystra. The crowds shouted, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes. We also see Theoxenia in the hospitality of Janus and Saturn. Janus, the fabled son of Uranus, is believed to have been the most ancient king of Italy who hospitably received Saturn when, as a fugitive from Crete, the father of Jupiter banished his son, arrived in a ship on the shores of Latium. The hospita Hospitality of Saturn Ovid's Fasti describes Janus as the beginner, the first king of Latium. He hospitably received the god Saturn, who was an immigrant god, expelled from heaven by Jupiter. Saturn came to the Janiculum by ship. He arrived in Italy dethroned and fugitive, but brought agriculture and civilization for which he was rewarded by Janus with a share of the kingdom, becoming king himself. Under his reign were the Golden Ages. Janus is chaos, and Saturn is order. They are part of the order of Cao. The Janus effect is the he Hegelian dialectic, for example, medical terrorism or climate terrorism. So what are the keys that Janus holds, and how did the Pope get a hold of them? Very early indeed did the Bishop of Rome show a proud and ambitious spirit, but for the first three centuries their claim for superior honor was founded simply on the dignity of their see as being that of the imperial city, the capital of the Roman world. When, however, the seat of empire was removed to the east and Constantinople threatened to eclipse Rome, some new ground for the maintaining the dignity of the Bishop of Rome must be sought. That new ground was found when, in 378, the Pope fell heir to the keys that were the symbols of two well-known pagan divinities of Rome. Janus bore a key and Cybele bore a key. These are the two keys of the Pope that the Pope emblazons on his arms as the ensigns of his spiritual authority. That's from Alexander Hislop, The Two Babylonians. <clears throat> so... They are the keys of Janus, time and space, and the keys of Kybele, the great mother, growth and regeneration. To the Christians of Rome, the Pope represented Peter the Apostle, while to the pagan priesthood, he represented Peter the Interpreter of the Petroma, the Book of Stone. Thus, the Pope was the express counterpart of Janus, the double-faced, Catholicism now had both Christians and practicing pagans under its umbrella. Uh, there are two Peters, or no Peters, 
the Apostle Peter never went to Rome, and Simon Magus, Peter of Rome, was the first Pope of Rome, Peter the Interpreter. The original high priest was named Hermes, and he explained these mysteries. He held the keys of Peter Roma, or the Petroma, the Book of Stone. This book was read by the Hierophant to the candidate for initiation into the ancient Eleusinian mysteries, Demeter, Persephone, Hecate, the goddess Delta, which we'll get into later. The two large tablets that were joined together represented the dual aspect of truth or ultimate reality as one. Peter, the man who was the interpreter or interpreter of the mysteries, the Hierophant in Greek, was a title of the chief god or Jew Peter. He was the one who brought to light the sacred mystery of Zeus. Thus, Zeus Peter, Jupiter, the pater or father of the gods, was derived from the Greek Zeus. This is the Hierophant with the key. Peter, the interpreter of the mysteries, with the cock, and Janus with key and cock. Hierophant. One of Janus, Janus's important symbols is also embedded in the Hierophant card, dressed as a pontiff, whose outfit derives from the pomp of the Babylonian costume, as Belshazzar himself might have done, in robes of scarlet, with the crozier of Nimrod in his hand, wearing the mitre of Dagon, and bearing the keys of Janus and Kybel. So the Hierophant card is number five of the Tarot. It is of the element Earth and Taurus, ru ruled by Venus. Saint Corona also encodes Taurus. Here is the delivery of the keys by Perugino. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Cephas, Peter, Petros, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing. To bind and to loose simply means to forbid by an indisputable authority and to permit by an indisputable authority. And undisputed is also a synonym for pandemic from which we get Catholic, total, sweeping, all-embracing, ecumenical, global, multinational, undisputed, and worldwide, terrestrial. It is the key of undisputed authority that is on the logo of the National Security Agency. Kai Bell bore the key which opened the gates of the invisible world. The key of growth and regeneration the key of incorporation. It is also the key of ritual androgyny. This is the arch Gallus making sacrifice to Kybel and Attis. Agallus was a eunuch priest of the Phrygian goddess Kybel and her consort Attis. She was actually a pedophile man. Attis was a baby. The Gauli became the priests of Rome. She holds the silver key, the terrestrial doorway into incarnation or incorporation. She is the Earth Mother, Ceres, Isis, Virgo, Kybel, in a chariot drawn by two lions. The goddess holds up a key which links her with, the, with Egyptian mythology. This is the Ankh, or the key of life, an ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic symbol that was most commonly used to represent life. This is Osiris holding the key to the silver gate, the Ankh. Kybel was originally worshipped as Cardea, the power of the hinge. 
It was only in the second century before Christian era that the worship of Kybel under that name was introduced into Rome. But the same goddess under the name Cardea, with the power of the key, was worshipped in Rome along with Janus ages before Ovid. Cardea is the hinge as well as the heart. We get cardiac from cardia, heart, curd, heart, core, the heart of the innermost part of anything, and apple, the core of the fruit, heart from Latin core, curd. And here we get myocarditis, inflammation of the heart from the Latin core, Saint Corona. Dea is goddess, Cardea. The cardinals are the priests of Cardea. The Western apostate Christendom recognized in it as inherent in the office of the Bishop of Rome. To enable the Pope, however, to rise to the full plenitude of power, which he now asserts, the cooperation of others was needed. When his power increased, when his domain extended, and especially after he became a temporal sovereign, the key of Janus became too heavy for his single hand. He needed some, some to share with him the power of the hinge. Hence his privy counselors, his high functionaries of state, who were associated with him in the government of the church and the world, got the now well-known title of cardinals, the priests of the hinge. So cardinal comes from the hinge. Cardinal, Roman Catholic Church nominated by the Pope, the Sacred College. Deep Scarlet, New World Songbird is a, is a cardinal of greatest importance. Cardo, hinge, priests as pivots of the church. And one example of cardinal is one of the cardinal principles of the law of trusts. And this is how we are incorporated or incorporated through the Cardinal Trust Law, the Sestri KV Act of 1666. But I guess there were several Sestri KV Acts. But this one was in London in 1666 during the Black Plague and the Great Fires of London. Parliament enacted behind closed doors the Sestri KV Act to subrogate the rights of men and women. All men and women were declared dead, lost at sea, beyond the sea. This is the Admiralty Law, Maritime Law. London took custody of everybody and their property into trust. Capital letters are used anywhere in the name refers to the legal entity fiction, the company or corporation. And this was based on the earlier Unum Sanctum, in which every human creature is to be subject to the Roman Pontiff based on hieratic, hierocratic theory, since Christ was Lord of the universe, both king and priest and the Pope was his earthly victor, vicar. The Pope must also possess both spiritual and temporal authority over everybody in the world. Cardinal is also the cardinal cross in astrology. The equinox and solstice signs of the cardinal cross. These are the equinoxes and these are the solstices, Cancer and Capricorn. And we see within the cardinal cross is the delta. The keys of Janus were called Jus Retendi Cardinis. Janus, the key bearer, was the god of doors and hinges. He was called Petulcius and Clusius, the opener and the shutter, worshipped in Rome as the grand mediator. Whatever deity was to be invoked, Janus was always invoked first as the god of gods. The father and son were combined in his divinity. He opened and closed the door of heaven. 
To Janus as mediator belonged the government of the world and all power in heaven, in earth, and the sea. His key was called Jus Vertendi Cardinis, the power of the turn of turning the hinge, the opening of doors of heaven, or of shutting the gates of peace or war upon earth. So this is to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3 7. Jesus claims the prerogative of Janus. The key of David, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. The hinge of the celestial axis is 23.5 degrees. We are told that our Earth tilts 23.5 degrees, but I don't really buy into the globe Earth uh, paradigm. So is it the sky that's tilted 23 degrees? 23.5? So these, the key also the keys are also to the uh, silver gates and the golden gates in the heavens. There are only two gates into heaven, one between Taurus and Gemini, known as the silver gate of heaven, where Orion and Osiris is located, the gate of man, and one between Scorpio and Sagittarius, where Ophiuchus is located, known as the golden gate of heaven, the gate of the gods. So here is the silver gate, the gate of man, between the horns of Taurus. And here is the golden gate. And here is Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus and Orion represent the part of our cycle of life that we all incarnate into as going from earthly beings through the gate of man to eternal beings through the gate of gods. <clears throat> and Taurus, of course, is an earth sign. Corona's feast day, May 14th, marked the heliacal rise of Aldebaran in Taurus, forever linking her with the silver key of the Great Mother. The serpent bearer is represented as Ophiuchus, the twelve disciples plus Christ, and Ophiuchus is the thirteenth zodiac. Always the flag of Janus nearby. Ophiuchus represents Asclepius, the god of medicine and doctors. He is always depicted holding a great serpent or snake. A snake's venom can either kill or cure. Asclepius concocted a healing potion from the venom of serpents, the serpent, mixing it with gorgon's blood and an unknown herb. This potion gave humans access to immortality. Pluto and Zeus. Plutus, Pluto asked Zeus to reconsider the ramifications of the death of death. So Zeus killed Asclepius with his thunderbolt, then placed his body among the stars as the consolation of Phaecus, the serpent holder. So the silver gate is above Orion, Osiris, at the center of the Duat, the Egyptian netherworld. Ancient Greco-Egyptians believed that the souls reside in the Milky Way between our incarnations, and that there are two gates on the Milky Way where the ecliptic intersects it, the silver gate between the horns of Taurus and the golden gate near Ophiuchus, where souls ascend. Other versions say that souls of men, humans, can ascend by either gate, but that the silver gate leads to reincarnation, and the golden gate leads beyond reincarnation. The golden gate is the gate the gods descend into this reality. So Isis's horns and the sun disks indicate her guardianship of the silver gate, the gate of birth, and the winged scarab indicate the gate of death. The journey of the soul and the disk of the Milky Way is called the galactic midplane. The mystical journey of the soul in Ptolemaic cosmology Ancient Egyptians rep represented the silver and golden gates as beginning and ending waypoints along the journey of the soul. The silver key to the stargate Aldebaran, the white sow goddess. 
So the Silver Gate is just above the hand of Orion, who the Egyptians associated with Osiris, and they depicted him holding a star in his hand. In the Orion mystery, Bouval and Gilbart presumed this to be the star of Aldebaran. The Egyptian word for star, sabah, also means door. So Os Osiris is holding a star gate. In some depictions, Osiris is holding an ankh toward the gate. So this must be the key the unlock that unlocks the star gate of Aldebaran. And the Egyptian Book of the Dead calls Orion Smati Osiris, the barley god. Uh, the white goddess is also called the barley goddess and also the white sow goddess. We'll get to that in a moment. Aldebaran is the white sow goddess. Aldebaran is a member of the Hyades. Um, it was a sow. The colloquial, colloquial title among Roman country people for Hyades was Succule, the little pigs from Sus, sow. Aldebaran and its companions were like the sow with her litter. They are also called the rainy ones, the Hyades. The name of the constellation comes from the Greek Huedis, by folk etymology from Huen to rain, in reference to their weeping for their dead brother Hyas, but pertaining for perhaps from the Greek heis for pig, the Latin name for the constellation being succulae, little pigs. Aldebaran is one of the four royal stars, watcher of the east, Antares, Regular, and Fomalhaut, being the other royal stars linked with Archangel Michael, aka Angel of Light and Protection. He is the military commander of the heavenly host. Again, the flag of Janus. Aldebaran is the eye of God, here with the delta within the corona. For Hyas, his mother wept, and for Hyas, his sad sisters, and Atlas soon to bow his neck to the burden of the pole. Yet the love of the sisters exceeded that of both parents. It won for them a place in the sky but Hyas gave them their name. That's the Hyades. Mythologically, the Hyades were daughters of Atlas and Aethra, and hence half-sisters of the Pleiades, with whom they made up the fourteen Atlantides, or the Do Dodona Dodonaides, the nymphs of Dodona, to whom Jupiter entrusted the nurture of the infant Bacchus in Nysa, Dionysus, the Zeus of Nysa. This is the hinge or the select celestial axis, the pole of Cardea. The virtuous Pleiades and their sister stars, the Hyades, the stars which total 14 are known as the Atlantides, the daughters of At At Atlas, associated by B William Blake with the 12 daughters of Albion, for Blake's Albion, like Atlas, is patriarch of the Atlantic continent. Albion, the white, Albina, the white goddess. And we'll come to that soon. More Vatican keys. The whole structure is a key. The key of David can also refer to ritual sodomy. And I did, I mirrored a video about that. Upside down cross is the uh, cross of St. Peter. The key is also the power of Rome using Latin. Latin roots are used in English descriptions of theology, the sciences, medicine, and law, the official language in the Holy See of the Vatican. Ancient Latin is not English. It's that simple. It exists under a different grammatical rule. The official language of foreign Rome is ancient Latin. You become the foreign citizen of Rome, the trustee slave of the world. 
the hosti-poti relationship, the guest master. Latin, Latinus, literally belonging to Latium, Rome, to spread, to extend, flat country. Prehistoric, the folk etymology connected it with lat latere, to lie hidden, and a fable of Saturn. So the earliest known hospitals, as infirmaries, were the Asclepions. From 1100 to 900 BC, over 300 were built, ancient Greek temples dedicated to the healer god Asclepius. The Asclepion at Epidurus was the most celebrated healing center of the classical world, the place where ill people went in the hope of being cured. To find out the right cure for their ailments, they spent a night in the Enquimetria, a big sleeping hall. In their dreams, the god himself would advise them what they had to do to regain their health. This was called incubation. It was the uh, Asclepion. He was the son of Apollo, the god of plagues and healing, and Coronis, the crow. Those physicians and attendants who served the god were known as Therapeutae of Asclepius, the first organized worldwide priesthood. Yeah, and why were they ill in the first place? That's what I'd like to know. Incubation was the central healing ritual likened to a dream quest. Symptoms were always viewed as external expressions of the deeper underlying reality of the psyche, correspondence, synchronicity between the body and mind. The outer and inner world is what constituted every symptom. While incubating, the sick person slept in the abaton, lying on a cline, from which we uh, get our word clinic. The ritual of incubation was very much an initiation into a mystery, a crossing over to a higher dimension of being. Asclepius himself appeared in a dream or a vision, touched the sick person, thus healing it. Here's the Roman cubiculum, the cubiculum hospitalis. Uh, incubation, a laying upon eggs, incubare, to hatch, literally, literally to lie on, to rest on, cubare, to lie. Cubiculum, bedroom, from cubare, to lie down. So, agamesis is the Greek term for incubation. The Therapeutae of Asclepius were a hereditary priesthood, a medical brotherhood that exists to this day. They were known as the sons of Asclepius, the Coens, the Cohen, the Coenim of Kos, the Kentors, the Curites, the Telkines, and Levites, to name a few. Later in Wales and Scotland, Ireland and Britain, they would be known as the Druids and the Chaldees, the, the original priests who had helped form the Catholic Church. Asclepius's name means to cut open. Coronis underwent the very first Caesarean section as Apollo saved his son from his dying mother. And Mercury presided over this first Caesarean. The medicine of Asclepius was the blood of the Gorgon, Medusa. After Medusa was slain, her blood was divided between Athena and Asclepius. It was believed that the blood from her right vein cured and from her left killed. Any healing work required a careful and loving unification of opposites. Both the name Medusa and the word medicine come from the same Greek word, med, which means to devise to use powerful means, to consider, judge, estimate, measure. It was Apollo who called for moderation in everything at his Delphic oracle. With excess, any remedy could, return, could turn into poison. So this is the root, mad, to be wise, madha, the healing art. Also medicus, remedium, to heal, cure, be good for or against disease.
Externally, it is the serpent. Internally, it is the worm. The rod of Asclepius is a symbol of the medical brotherhood. The hidden esoteric meaning is that it is a worm entwined around the staff. In the exoteric or the outer meaning, to non-initiates, it is a serpent, and that we humans are just descendants of the worm via the sperm. So the worm is a serpent, the snake, the dragon, the reptile, serpent worm, vermis, ver, to turn, to bend, as in it, entwining worms. The ancient category, serpents, scorpions, maggots, supposed causes of certain diseases, worms, any disease arising from the presence of parasitic worms, vermin, noxious animals, vermis, the worm, to turn, to bend. And these are all the synonyms for noxious So who is the parasite? Well, that's the big question. The name Levite is a derivation of the root leva, to twine, to join, with a literal meaning of wreathed, twisted in folds, like the worm, Leviathan, the sea monster, a form of Satan, the dragon, the serpent, to wind, to twist, to turn, as in the serpent's coils, to bend. The priests would be known in the Bible as the Levites of the tribe of Levi, who the father of English history and the doctor of the church, St. Bede, said, allegorically, the Levites represent those attached to the Catholic Church. The name Levite is from the root word, which means to join or to bind, the snaky monster. Levites were the first tribe drawn from those divisions of the Israelites to aid in the repair of the temple, making them the first Templars. The sons of Asclepius, the Koans of Kos, the Koanim, the Curates, the Telkines, the Levites, the Druids, all priests of the Catholic Church. The rod of Asclepius signifies the Brotherhood's knowledge and control of the worm, all the parasites, bacteria, and fungi that plague us us humans. Officially, the etymology of Asclepius means to cut open. Another etymology encodes the ask, the ascrid worm, while lep encodes leprosy, a general term for plague in the past. Here's the ascaris parasite, the most common parasitic worm in humans. And lep. Asclepius, the ancient knowledge of disease control. Here's Dante's Satan. Cerberus is called Il Gran Vermo, the great worm, in Dante's Inferno, the third circle of gluttony. The Parasha, the 28th Torah portion weekly reading deals with ritual impurity and dress, it addresses the cleansing from skin disease, the tsarat, the laws of leprosy. And they would have us cover our upper lip and cry, unclean, unclean. We are all unclean lepers who wear the mask. Apollo delivers Asclepius to Chiron to teach him the art of healing. Chiron is another key, and Chiron is also a pharmaceutical corporation. It was an American biotech company that was acquired by Novartis in 2006, and this Chiron Corporation actually owns the patent of the coronavirus. Novartis is in Basel, Switzerland, which is their base, Baal in French. Asclepius arrives in Rome in the form of a snake. This is Tiber Island. It was first built in 290 BC and was dedicated in 289. According to legend, a plague hit Rome in 
293, leading to the Senate to build a temple to Asclepius, Latinized to Esculap Esculapius. After having consulted the Sibylline books and gained a favorable response, a delegation of Roman elders was sent to Epidaurus in Greece, famous for a sanctuary to Asclepius, to obtain a statue of him to bring back to Rome. The legend also relates that during the propitiatory, propitiatory rites, a large serpent, one of the gods' attributes, slithered from the sanctuary and hid in the Roman ship. Certain that this was a sign of the gods' favor, the Roman delegation quickly returned home, where the plague was still raging. As they were on the river Tiber and about to reach Rome, the snake crawled out of the ship and disappeared from sight on the island, marking the site where the temple was to be built. Work on the temple began immediately, and it was dedicated in 289. Soon afterwards, the plague ended. Uh, it's my opinion that all plagues are hoaxes. This is the island with the hospital showing its similarly, similarity to a trireme. The trireme was introduced to Greek by the Corinthians. The Sibylline books were a collection of oracular utterances and were consulted at momentous crises. The earliest collection was from the Trojan Sibyl on Mount Ida in the Trode. The books were kept in the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitol. Some supposedly genuine Sibylline verses are preserved in the Book of Marvels or Memorabilia of Phlegon of Trallis. They reported the birth of an androgyne and prescribed a long list of rituals and offerings to the gods. Revenants, oracular heads, hermaphrodites, sex changers, child-bearing males, human animal, children, giant bones, amazing fertility, multiple births, multiple body features, a sample of some of the themes explored in On Marvels. So this uh, fantasy of childbearing males is an ancient one, and it's coming for, to fruition today. There was a hospital on Tiber Island the Fate Benefratelli Hospital. Located on the western side, it was established in 1585, is, is currently run by the Brothers Hospitallers of St. John of God. The hospital is known for having sheltered Jews during the Holocaust by diagnosing them with a fictitious disease, ca disease called Syndrome K. K equals 11. The Wheel of Karma. They were honored thus as righteous among nations. The Brothers Hospitaller, as an order, has been officially entrusted with the medical care of the Pope. The Therapeutae of Asclepius were among a long line of doctor priests. By keeping the te teachings private, the priesthood was able to amass a huge fortune and control the market for medical care as the world's first and only trained physicians. They would also become bankers as a result of their wealth and royal connections, who then became very, very powerful under the protection of the Romans after they were absorbed into the Roman Empire and given special freemen and tax-free status in the Republic. From folk healing to a completely controlled industry, industry ruled by commerce, governments, and kings, the caduceus, the symbol of commerce as well as healing. The ancient healing centers morphed into churches, hospitals, and banks, i.e. corporations. On the island of Crete, the Telkines had perfected their skills in art, religion, and magic. They also invented various methods of pharmacia, or sorcery. They would eventually profane the gifts of gods, of the gods by turning their white magic into black magic by poisoning nature, animals, humans. For many centuries, the Telkines had ruled from Crete before spreading their culture of magic and war to the various parts of the world. The Greek historian Homer had said various tribes jostled each other in that island and eventually the gods had killed the Telkines for their magical crimes against humanity and nature particularly when they produced a mixture of Stygian water and sulfur, which killed animals and plants. 
The Telkines were the nine sons of either Poseidon or Pontus, the primordial sea god. They were the sorcerers of the underworld. The Council of the Trident is the Council of Trent. And the Concilium Tridentium is the embodiment of the Jesuits' counter-reformation. So the Telkines live on today as the Jesuits. Hecate, often referred to as the mother of witchcraft, she is closely associated with the moon, magic, portals, and doorways, and is known as the guardian of the crossroads. Hecate embraces both light and dark and is revered as a triple moon goddess, representing the three faces of maiden, mother, and crone. So the Telkines worship Hecate. The Egyptian Imhotep was a polymath, poet, judge, engineer, magician, scribe, astronomer, astrologer, and especially a physician. He was the first real doctor known in human history, and he invented many medications and drugs that were used to cure a large number of diseases. The Greeks equate, equated him with Asclepius. And I believe this is all fake history. In Babylon, Hammurabi's code of law specified if a surgeon performed a major operation on a nobleman with a bronze lancet and caused the death of this man, they shall cut off his hands. The Babylonian conception of illness was demonic possession. They employed haruspiki, the divination from animal organs. So this is uh, a foreshadowing foreshadowing of what I'll get into in my next series of videos concerning the Piacenza liver. Hippocrates, Hippocrates was the Greek physician of classical Greek who is considered the father of medicine, the father of the Hippocratic school of medicine. This intellectual school revolu revolutionized ancient Greek medicine and established it as a profession. He improved the practice of medicine by divorcing it from supernatural causes and highlighting observation before intervention. This revolved around the four humors. Here is a mosaic of Asclepius and Hippocrates on, I'm sorry, Hippocrates of Kos. The Hippocratic Oath originally stated, I swear by Apollo healer, by Asclepius, by Hygieia, by Panacea, and by all the gods and goddesses, making them my witness that I will carry out, according to my ability and judgment, this oath and this indenture. It does not contain the phrase, first do no harm, which is commonly attributed to it. In medieval Europe, the hospital was called the Hotel Dieu, the Hostel of God. During the late 8th century and 9th centuries, Emperor Charlemagne decreed that a hospital should be attached to each cathedral and monastery. This brings us to the Hospitallers. Who were the Hospitallers? The three Catholic military orders, the Teutonic Knights, the Knights Templar, and the Knights Hospitaller, were supposedly the tip of Christendom's lance. Uh, from is that where we get the Lancet, the medical journal? The mythic predecessors of the military order of Jesuits today. The Knights Hospitaller were the continuation of the Cohenite Brotherhood after assuming control of the island of Kos from Rhodes. The order of Knights of Hospitaller were the Saint John of Ju of Saint John of Jerusalem. <laughs> Hospitaller of Saint John of Jerusalem were commonly known as the Knights Hospitaller. Today, they are the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, which has a higher authority than the Vatican. They are permanent observer mission of the Sovereign Order of Malta to the United Nations. Queen Elizabeth, 
is the head of the Protestant branch of the SMOM. Pope Francis received an audience of the Grand Master of the Sovereign Order of Malta, Matthew Festing, and 11 dignitaries, 900 years of papal recognition of the Hospitaller Order. And this is the Maltese cross of the Knights Hospitaller. And this is sort of an esoteric breakdown of what the Maltese cross stands for. What was the hospital of the Knights Hospitaller? The monastic Hospitaller order was founded following the First Crusade by Gerald Tom confirmed or incorporated by the Pope in 1113. Gerard acquired the territory and revenues for his order throughout the Kingdom of Jerusalem and beyond. The original hospice was expanded to an infirmary, an actual hospital, near the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Initially, the group cared for pilgrims in Jerusalem, but the order soon extended to providing pilgrims with an armed escort, which grew into a substantial force. Thus, the Order of St. John became a military order without losing its charitable character. The original hospital, hospital hospice was set up to house and care for all the faithful pilgrims who came to visit their Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So, here is the Hospitaller's Quarter. Here is their flag of the Hospitaller's. The birth of the Order of St. John dates back to around 1048. The merchants from the ancient Marine Republic of Amalfi had obtained from the Caliph of Egypt the authorization to build a church, convent, hospital in Jerusalem to care for the pilgrims. So this is actually the flag of Amalfi. The Amalfi Cross. Hospitals and Maritime Law. Amalfi was founded by Her Hercules in the name of his beloved nymph Amalfi. He wanted to bury her in the most enchanting place on earth in which he founded the city with her name. In 1048, the Amalfitans founded the Hospital of St. John in Jerusalem. It was also, of course, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Amalfian laws were a code of maritime laws compiled in the 12th century. They are one of the maritime republics. We have Venice, Genoa, Pisa, and Amalfi. Genoa, Janus. They also introduced the compass. The Amalfitan merchants settled in Jerusalem and inquired the southwest corner of the Hadrianic Forum uh, in the location of the Church of St. Mary of Latins. This was set up by Charlemagne in 800. In 1099, the Crusader Knights injured during the Siege of Jerusalem were treated at the Hospice Hospital and afterward, after recovering, started the Order of the Knights Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem named after the church, also known as the Knights Hospitaller. I don't necessarily believe any of this history. I think it's all myth. Here is a description of St. John's, the St. John's and who they are. You can read about that and how they are the winter and summer solstices. The Muristan is a complex of streets and shops in the Christian quarter of the old city. It's the site of the hospital of the Knights Hospitaller. Muristan means hospital. The quarters that make up Jerusalem's old city. Here's the Christian quarter. Here is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre.
The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the holiest site of the Catholic Church. It's in the Christian Quarter, or the Muristan, of the old city of Jerusalem. It contains two of the holiest sites in Christianity, the site where Jesus was crucified, Calvary, and Jesus' empty tomb, where he was buried and resurrected. During the 4th century, the Roman Emperor Constantine ordered the construction of Christian holy sites in the city, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. He was the first Roman Emperor to embrace Christianity. He sent his mother Helena on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in search of the Holy Sepulchre and the True Cross. The church was consecrated the 13th of September in 335. So here is how she supposedly found the True Cross. Finally, weeks after searching with sweet-smelling dust and a flash of lightning, she pointed to the place where she instructed her local guide, Judas Syrianakis, and started digging. Finally, they uncovered three crosses. To test which one of these crosses truly belonged to Jesus Christ, they searched for a leper at the outskirts of Jerusalem. Once one was found, they returned back to the site of Golgotha. The leper was instructed to touch each of the crosses one by one. He touched the first one, and nothing happened. He touched the second one, and still nothing happened. Finally, when he touched the third and final cross, the leper was instantly healed. It was this cross that healed the leper, and for that reason it is known as the True Cross. The True Cross and Leprosy. So here's the supposed history of Jerusalem. Here's the site of the Holy Sepulchre, Jesus' tomb, Calvary, outside of Jerusalem walls in 30 AD. Hadrian came in 135 AD and built his temples of Jupiter and Venus over them. And then finally, in 325 AD, Constantine built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Following the siege of AD 70 during the First Jewish-Roman War, the Second Temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was reduced to ruins. In 130, Hadrian rebuilt the city, renaming it Aelia Capitolina after himself the Jupiter Capilina, Capitolinus, the chief Roman deity. Hadrian placed the city's main forum at the location of the Muristan. Hadrian built a large temple to the goddess Venus, which later became the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So he built it on the Cardo Maximus. This is the Cardo. And Elia means Helios. And I also noted the similarity of Aliyah, making Aliyah, by the Jews who returned to Israel. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is on the Cardo, which means the hinge, as we've already seen. Here's more monuments. His uh, family deity was Aphrodite. The bull, Aldebaran. So, what exactly is the Cardo and its intersection, the Decamanus? A Cardo Maximus was located in all Roman cities, military camps. It was the main north south road that ran through the city and served as the center of the local economy. It was also the main branch for all other roads. The Cardo Maximus was the hinge or axis of the city, derived from Cardea, the heart. Elia Capitolina was laid out with a Hippodamian grid plan of narrow streets and wider avenues. This is how they built their cities, the Cardo and the Decamanus. And this is an Etruscan priest or augur delineating the Templum of the Sky. He would put his posterior or back to the north. His right hand would be to the west, which was the Pars Hostilis, and his left hand was the, was the Pars Familiars, the lucky side. And this south was the front. Deku means 
intersection and Manu's hands. And you get the same with the hands on the cross, the Deca Manus and the Cardo. So it was the Hippodamium uh, grid plan that informs all of our cities today. He invented the division of the cities into precincts and also laid out the street plans. His ambition always to be different from other people made his life also peculiar in a variety of ways. And some thought that he was carrying out his oddities too far with his long hair and expensive ornaments, wearing the same time clothing that was cheap but warm in summer and winter alike. He wished to be considered an expert in a whole range of natural sciences that was the first person not likely taking part in the working of the Constitution to attempt a description, ideal one, blah, blah, blah. Hippodamius of Miletus, a flamboyant agent of order. He was the urban planner and physician, the father of European urban planning. So this is a different idea of order is really an agent of chaos. The gridiron layout of a town or city is not new. It is, in fact, the most pervasive city design on Earth. Here is Manhattan's grid plan, ancient Alexandria, and Egypt, and Mohenjo-Daro, where they said it even originated and spread to ancient Greece. The groma is the surveyor's cross. At the foundation of a colony, the auspices were taken, the purpose for the presence of the augur. But the business of the augur did not extend beyond the religious part of the ceremony. The division and measurement of the lands were made by professional measurers. These were the finitores, the mensores, the agrimensores. They stake out the right angle line by using the groma device, the groma. G, Roma. G means right angle, turning to the right. It's the cruci crucifixion of the land. The surveyor's cross is the basis of the holy state. Based on the crucifixion of the sky, the templum. A vertical rod surmounted by a cross with plumb lines, the Romans as well as Egyptians trace orthogonal alignments, right angles, the directions east-west, the decamanus, and north-south, the cardus, placing the gnomon at the center of a circle marking the points touched on the circumference by its shadow before and after midday. They create the orthogonal grid. Roma Quadrata, Square Rome, was an area, perhaps a structure within the original Pomerium of the ancient city of Rome. Cardo Maximus, Roma Quadrata. The whole world is Roma Quadrata. The Roman goddess was persona. Um, the Cardo was personified by the Roman goddess Cardea. And I will take a short break here. Okay, welcome back to part two. We're going to be looking at the goddess Cardea. Cardea is the Roman goddess of the door hinge, who protects the family and children of the house and keeps evil spirits from crossing the threshold. Her name comes from the Latin word cardo, which means hinge, and which also encompasses the wider symbolism of the pole or axis around which the earth spins. She is therefore a goddess of the center as well as the change that emanates out from that center. Thales, tales say that Cardea and the Roman god Janus were lovers, and that he gifted her the door hinge as her emblem and with the power to prevent evil spirits from passing through doors. 
Because she could keep bad spirits out of the house, Cardea was worshipped as the protector of children. According to the poet Ovid, Cardea has come to open what is closed and to close what is open. So here is the definition of hinge. And cardo, here is an old Roman hinge. The gate is nothing without a hinge. Janus to Cardea. But before she was Cardea, she was Carna, the goddess of incarnation. In Ovid's Fasti, Cardea was conflated with Carna. Carna was a nymph, huntress with a javelin, the daughter of Hellernus, god of the beans, Caro, Cranes, flesh, meat, food. So the Fasti is a Latin poem written by the poet Ovid and published in 8 AD. It explains the origins of Roman holidays. It's the Roman calendar, or Fasti. The cult of Rome is explained in Ovid's Fasti. Here's an aspect of Diana. She doesn't have her uh, arrows and quiver. She is Diana with the javelin. So let's read from Fasti. This is the first day of June, the Kalends. The first day is given to thee, Karna. She is the goddess of the hinge. By her divine power, she opens what is closed and closes what, it, what is open. Time has dimmed the tradition which sets forth how she acquired the power she owns. But you shall learn it from my song. Near to the Tiber lies an ancient grove of Alernus. The pontiffs still bring sacrifices thither. She, there a nymph was born. Men of old named her Krane, often wooed in vain by many suitors. Her wont it was to scour the countryside and chase the wild beasts with her darts, and in the hollow vale to stretch the knotty nets. No quiver had she, yet they thought that she was Phoebus's sister. And Phoebus, thou needst not have been ashamed of her. If any youth spoke to her words of love, she straightway made him this answer. In this place there is too much light, and with the light too much of shame. If thou wilt lead to a more retired cave, I'll follow. While she conf confidingly went in front, she no sooner reached the bushes than she halted and hid herself, and was no wise to be found. Janus had seen her, and the sight had roused his passion. To the hard-hearted nymph he used soft words. The nymph, as usual, bade him seek a more sequestered cave, and she pretended to follow at his heels, but deserted her leader. Fond fool, Janus sees what goes on behind his back. Vain is thy effort. He sees thy hiding place behind him. Vain is thy effort. Lo, said I, for he caught thee in his embrace, as thou didst lurk behind a rock, and having worked his will, he said, in return for our dalliance, be thine the control of hinges. Take that for the price of thy lost maidenhood. So saying, he gave her a thorn, and white it was, wherewith she could repel all doleful harm from doors. So caro is meat, it's the flesh of incarnation. Karna and corona are related through the meat. Perhaps it's the manner of her grisly death that St. Corona is known as the patron saint of butchers. Others suppose that it is because the people understood her name as Corona, which is associated with caro, flesh. The root C-R-N is carne, corona, carnea. Here is the goddess Carna who is transformed into Cardea. St. Corona, patron saint of treasure hunters, lumberjacks, and butchers, and plague. And remember her name is Stephanie as well. She is the fruit of the date palm. So here is Caro. Meat, peace, portion. Body, flesh, meat, the pulp of a fruit, descendant of Cor, Corona. 
Kara, care to cut. Cairo, to cut, I cut off. To cut, to mow, to separate. Caro is the flesh, the meat, the pulp of fruit, the body, the corpus. Butchers cut meat. In the Bible, the word is karat. To cut down, to destroy, to make a covenant, to hew. To cut off a body part, to eliminate, to kill, to cut a covenant. To hew. To hew is to chop or cut something, especially wood or coal, with an axe or pick or other tool, hence the lumberjack. Karath is to make a covenant. Here it is in Strong's again. I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off. Genesis 9.11 covenant with Abraham, the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh is, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, the soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. To cut a covenant, to circumcise. So here we have the covenant of the pieces, an event in which God revealed himself to Abraham and made a covenant with him. God announced to Abraham that his descendants would eventually inherit the land of Israel. God tells Abram that he would have a son born unto him and asks him to count the stars if possible and promises, So shall thy seed be. God commands Abram to prepare an animal sacrifice. Abram performed the sacrifice, cutting the animals into two pieces. So circumcision is to be the permanent sign of everlasting covenant with Abraham and his male descendants, and is known as the Brit Mila, pieces of foreskin or the holy prepuce. Here he is cutting a covenant. Covenant, it's butchery. And surgeons are butchers. They know all about cutting the meat. Uh, Originally, doctors were supposedly very learned men who did not deign to cut the body. They employed butch butchers and told them what to do. Here is the instrument of circumcision. It looks very much like the headdress of Osiris, the Brit Mila. They are called the round heads. Is the Pope wearing a kippah? or are the Jews wearing a zucchetti? The form of this hat also represents a circumcised penis. Karna is the Roman goddess of the flesh. She is the protective Roman goddess and brings strength of the physical body. Her name in Latin means flesh. She protects and keeps healthy the vital organs, especially the lungs, liver, and heart. It was tradition to serve bacon and beans at her festival. Her festival was June 1st, the Fabrie Calende, the calend Calends of the Beans. So here is an impression of Karna, Mother Earth. Hellernus, the god of the beans, was Karna's father. He was a minor god of the underworld, god of the beans, using, uh, used during the Lemuria festival. In May, his sacred grove was near the mouth of the Tiber River. Sacrifices were made to him annually on the 1st of February by the Roman pontiffs, in which black ox was killed. He had one daughter, Karna, who was the goddess of protecting the intestines of children from vampires. Now here is the Lemuria festival which uh, What the Flock TV covers extensively. And uh, St. Corona's Day is the very day after the end of the Lemuria festival. It was celebrated on three days, May 9th, 11th, and 13th. 
because even days were considered unlucky, at midnight on the last day of the Lemuria, the Roman pater familias, the head of the family, would wake up and put on special clothing. No buckles, pins, or other items were allowed, and he had to be barefoot. He then put nine uncooked black fava beans in his mouth and spit them out as he walked around the house, saying, With each one, With these beans I redeem me and mine. The beans were tossed to ghosts by the Roman householders at the Lemuria to give them a chance of rebirth. They were offered to the goddess Carnea at her festival on June 1st because she had the keys of the underworld. The P Pythagorean mystics were bound by a strong taboo against eating of beans. Orpheus, to eat beans was to eat one's parents' heads. The Platonists excuse their abstention from beans on the rationalistic ground that they caused flatulence. But this came to much the same thing. Life was breath, and to break wind after eating beans was a proof that one had eaten a living soul. In Greek and Latin the same word anima and pneuma stand equally for gust of wind, breath, soul, or spirit. So this is the flower of the bean, and it's white and sacred to the white goddess. The reason for the Orphic taboo was that the bean grows spirally up its prop, pretending res resurrection, and that the ghosts contrive to be reborn as humans by entering into beans. And what exactly was the doleful harm that Carnea, Crane, Cardea was repelling from doorways? The stridges, the vampiric night birds, they are greedy birds. They are said to rend the flesh of sucklings with their beaks, and their throats are full of blood, with blood with which they have drunk. They are the screech owl, which is Lilith. They came into the chambers of Proca, a child of five days old, and he was fresh prey for the birds. They sucked the infant with their greedy tongues. So they went to Crane, and told what had befallen Procus. Crane said, Lay fear aside, thy nursling will be safe. She went to the cradle. Mother and father were weeping. Restrain your tears, she said. I myself will heal the child. Straightway she thrice touched the doorposts, one after the other with arbutus leaves. Thrice with arbutus she marked the threshold. She sprinkled the entr entrance with water. She held the raw innards of a sow just two months old, and thus spoke, Yea, birds of night, spare the child's innards with a small victim. A small victim falls for a small child. Take, I pray ye, a heart for a heart, entrails for entrails. This life we give you for a better life. When she had thus, thus sacrificed, she set the severed inwards in the open air, and forbade the present at the sacrifice to look at them. A rod of Janus, taken from the white thorn, was placed where a small window gave light to the chambers. After that, it is said the birds did not violate the cradle, and the boy recovered former color. So, Crane substituted pork for Procus. A strix is a vampiric monster, the strigus, the witch, the hag, the vampire. Cardea was able to keep away the strigus by hanging a little hawthorn at the door. So who is the infant Proca? Proca is the ancestor of Romulus and Remus. He was the grandfather. So what is the origin of the Strixes or Stridges? Polyphante was the granddaughter of Ares. Wishing to remain a virgin, Polyphante fled to the mountains to become a companion of Artemis. This provoked the ire of Aphrodite, the goddess of love and procreation, who viewed Polyphante's decision as a personal affront. To punish Polyphante for failing to honor her womanly duty, Aphrodite drove her mad and caused her to lust after a bear. Polyphante gave birth to two humanoid bear-like sons, Agrius and Aureus the result of her union with the bear.
they were cannibals who attacked strangers on the road. Zeus punished them by turning them into birds, heralding evil. Polyphante was transformed into the owl-like Strix. Aureus was turned into a bird called Lagos, or Eagle Owl, and Agrius was turned into a vulture, a despised carrion-eating bird. Their innocent servant was turned into a woodpecker. Hawthorne was a token of Carnea's transformation into Cardea. It was her principal emblem, a bough of Hawthorne. Other herbs that brought her power were Arbutus, the bean, and oak. So Hawthorne traces back to the Old English Hagathorn, a combination of Haga, hedge, and thorn. That's where we get the hag. According to medieval legend, Glastonbury Thorn was said to have miraculously grown there from the walking stick planted by Joseph of Arimathea. Since the reign of King James, it has been a Christmas custom to send a sprig of Glastonbury Thorn flowers to the sovereign, which is used to decorate the royal's family, royal family's dinner table. So, white thorn, hawthorn, is also called the may tree or may bush a branch decorated with flowers, ribbons, bright shells, rushlights, at Beltane. This is the maybush. And many believe that the thorn, crown of thorns of Jesus was made of hawthorn. The mayflower was actually named after hawthorn. So, uh, the mayflower is carrying the energy of Cardea into the new world. The Hague is actually named after Hawthorne. In addition to Hawthorne, Arbutus was sacred to Carnea, Cardea. It's called Arbutus Unedo, and it was named by Pl Pliny the Elder who said, Unum Tantum Edo, meaning I eat only one. It flowers and fruits at the same time, probably a symbol of the tranny. Joni Mitchell includes the reference to the Arbutus rustling in her song, For the Roses. She calls the Arbutus tree her favorite all-time tree. She had one outside her door in a house she built. And here is the lyric. The Arbutus is also featured on the coat of arms of Madrid. And here's a statue at the door portal of the sun. Stregeria is witchery, also called la vecchia religione, or the old religion. In Tuscany, Cardea is known as Caradora. She dries out the blood-suckling witches who are causing illness of a baby with twigs of arbutus and hawthorn wrapped in red cloth, which are hung in doorways and windows. Corbezzolo is arbutus. It's a symbol of eternity, pictured here with Kronos, the god of time. Arbutus is pitch pictured as the source of poetic inspiration, inventa. Okay, who is Cardea? Um, June is the hinge of the year, another term for summer solstice. Originally, Cardea was the hinge on which the year turned, that is, the goddess of the turning seasons. The hinge is a sy symbolic device celebrated each summer. Swinging on a swing was part of the ritual to encourage the growth of crops. Ancient Roman farmers hung balls, masks, small images of human figures called ocella in trees or doorways to swing in the wind. Children would skip along hand in hand, swinging their arms, singing songs of summer. The hinge on which turns the year is the North Star, so she was another goddess who lives in a starry castle at the hinge of the universe behind the north wind, as did Arianrod. Cardea is the keeper of the four winds. So here's a picture of the Ocella. Ocella. The North Star is the hinge of the sky. 
It is the key. Goddess of the turning seasons, the hinge of the year. The Earth's maximum axial tilt at summer solstice is 23 and a half degrees. Likewise, the sun's declination from the celestial equator is 23 and a half degrees. Carnea is celebrated on the calends of June in anticipation of Cardea, the hinge of the year. St. Uh, John the, of the Knights Hospitaller is also the day of summer solstice. Cardea is another triple goddess. She is associated with two little-known deities who presided over doorways, Forculus from Fores doors, plural because double doors were common on public buildings and elite homes, and Limen Limentinus from Limen, Limenus, the threshold. Three gods in one, the hinge, the door, and the threshold. These three doorway deities had a place in cosmology as the Yanatores terrestres, the doorkeepers of the earth, guarding the passage to the earthly sphere, carnal incarnation of the silver gate. Here are some old Roman hinges, and here's the double door of the four seasons. Cardo, a hinge or pivot, the first figure in the woodcut is the general form of the door. We find a pivot at the top and bottom. The second figure represents the hinge, cylindrical. And under these is drawn the threshold of the temple of the folding doors. Janus is the doorkeeper of the heavens, and Cardea is the doorkeeper of the earth. Kybel is Cardea. And this is the Polos crown, a high cylindrical crown of the mythological goddesses of the ancient Near East and Anatolia, adopted by the ancient Greeks, the mother goddesses Rhea and Kybel and Hera. The word also meant axis or pivot or pole. So this is the pole crown in honor of Cardea. Now we come to the White Goddess of Robert Graves. The White Goddess is an historical grammar of poetic myth, a book-length essay on the nature of poetic myth-making by author and poet Robert Graves. He argues that the true or pure poetry is inextricably linked with the ancient cult ritual of his proposed White Goddess and her son. He believed that one could be in the true presence of the White Goddess when reading a poem. The White Goddess deals with goddess worship as the prototypical religion. It was per first published in 48. He proposes the existence of the White Goddess of birth, love, and death, similar to the Mother Goddess represented by the phases of the moon. She lies behind the faces of the diverse goddesses of various European and pagan mythologies. The Threefold Muse. Here is the uh, Screech Owl. Lilith. Graves concluded that the male-dominant monotheistic god of Ju Judaism and its successors were the cause of the white goddess's downfall and thus the source of much of the modern world's woe. Here's a collection of pictures of Robert Graves and I believe he is an elite gender invert. He called himself a pseudo-homosexual. And this is his second wife, the American poet, Laura Riding, the supposed muse for the white goddess. Through forensic etymology, Graves argues for the worship of a single goddess under many names, an idea that came to be known as the matriarchal religion of the 1970s. Visual iconography was important to Graves' conception. He created a methodology for reading images he called iconotropy. This practice uh, was required, uh, one with, is required to reduce speech into its original images and rhythms, and then to combine these on several simultaneous levels of thought. 
he then decoded a wood cut of the judgment of Paris as depicting a, tr a single triple goddess rather than tr the traditional Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite of the narrative. In the white goddess he introduces the Celtic tree calendar. It's a 13-month calendar which is contradictory to the traditional uh, Celtic wheel of the year. This is the month of Hawthorne from May 13th to June 9th, uh, beginning on the last day of the festival of Demuria, actually. Druantia was the uh, eternal mother, and her name derives from Drus, or Dru for oak trees, goddess of fertility for plants and humans. She created the Celtic tree calendar, which divides the year into 13 months that correspond to the cycles of the moon. 364 days plus one intercalary day, December 23rd, a year and a day. This calendar is based on the Aum alphabet, but many scholars argue the calendar is a modern invention and has no historical basis. Here's the Celtic tree calendar overlaid with the traditional Celtic wheel of the year. Mistletoe is the most sacred plant of the calendar. It was the plant of the one intercalary day, December 23rd. Its botanical name is Viscum album. Common names include all heel, bird lime, mistletoe, Golden Bough, The Devil's Fugue, and Missile. So here's the etymology for viscous. It's the internal organs, the entrail, entrails, the flesh, the offspring. Also mistletoe, bird lime, made from mistletoe berries. Bowels, the entrails, the internal organs, sacred to Karna. Sacred to the white goddess, only mistletoe, native to much of Europe. It's the Yuletide mistletoe. It's an evergreen parasite growing on a deciduous host, the oak tree, only clearly seen in winter when the host trees are bare. The globe of evergreen mistletoe was hope among life, hope of life amongst the death and decay, the magic portal between the realms of the living and the dead. So it's a symbol of the parasite host relationship. Mistletoe from missile and twig, missile, basil, mistletoe, is propagated through the droppings of the missile thrush. It means urine, mist, or fine rain, may, to urinate. Missile means urine, and that would probably have something to do with the phosphorus that the YouTuber Crystal Time is always talking about. Bird lime, the missile thrush eats the berries and it makes the twigs sticky and it traps itself. In fine druid tr tradition, the mistletoe is cut to celebrate winter solstice, or Yule. The bunches were cut from the tree by a druid priest, amongst much ceremony on the sixth night of the new moon before the solstice, using a sickle made of gold. The plant mustn't touch the earth, so should be caught below the tree in a white cloth. On Yule night it is paraded and blessed, and distributed to all the sun worshippers at dusk or dawn on the twenty-first when the sun rises priests of the white coat, and this is the Wiccan Boleyn sickle for cutting herbs, and I wonder if this is the sickle that Anthony Fauci is named after, as Fauci's name means sickle. The ritual of the oak and mistletoe. Here they are cutting it down, and they sacrificed some white bulls 
in the parade as well. <clears throat> the French New Year's Day tradition, Au Gui La Neuf, with mistletoe the year nine. During the winter solstice, the Druids cut the sacred mistletoe by pronouncing the words Au Gel Anhu, which literally means that wheat germinates. So who is the white goddess? Graves called her Albina. The white goddess, Britain gains its earliest name, Albion, eldest of the fifty Danaiads, the origin of the German word Elven, Elf woman, Alb, Elf, Alpdruken, the nightmare or incubus, is connected with the Greek words Alphos, dull white leprosy, Alphiton, pearl barley, Alphito, the white goddess, who in class classical times has degenerated into a nursery bugbear, but seems to have originally been the Danaan barley goddess of Arco Argos. Albina was an Etruscan goddess. She was a white sow goddess, similar to the Celtic Kerithwan. And, of course, you have the Christianized Saint Alba. And first mentioned in the Historium, <coughs> Historia Britannum by Nennius, the Welsh monk who first wrote of King Arthur in 830 A.D., Here is uh, Wiki's official etymolo etymology of Albion. So Graves said Albina was the eldest of the De Deniads, or the Deniades. The Deniades were the fifty daughters of Deneus, who was the king of Libya. His myth is a foundation le legend of Argos. In Homer's Iliad, the Danans, the tribe of Danaeus, and Argives commonly designated the Greek forces opposed to the Trojans. Danaeus was the son of King Belus of Egypt, and the Naiad Akiro, the daughter of the river god Nilus. He was the twin brother of Aegyptus. Danaeus had fifty daughters, the Danaeids. Aegyptus comp commanded that the fifty sons should marry the Danaides. Danaeus elected to flee instead, and to that purpose he built a ship, built by the advice of Athena, the first ship that ever was. Aegyptus and his fifty sons arrived to take the Danaides, and Danaeus gave them to spare the Argives the pain of battle. However, he instructed his daughters to kill their husbands on their wedding night. Forty-nine followed through, but one... Hypermnestra refused because her husband, like Lynceus, honored her wish to remain a virgin. Lynceus and Hyper Hypermnestra then became a dynasty of Argi Argive kings, the Dinaid dynasty. They were punished in Tartarus by being forced to carry water in a sieve to fill a bath without bottom or with a leak and thereby wash off their sins. Here is the Argo. The shipwright Argus builds the Argo with the help of Athena. It transported the Danaides before it was used by Jason to retrieve the Golden Fleece. The ship had fifty oars. The prow of the ship was also made with a special piece of oak from Do Dodona, an area sacred to Zeus. The oak was said to be able to speak with a human voice and could tell oracles. So here are the Danaides. They incarnated an aspect of Danae as the college of fifty moon priestesses. They specialized in rain-making. Uh, sacred to her were the Siv. Other titles for her were Albina, Alfita, the eldest of the Danaides, the title of the high priestess of the college of fifty Danaides, the priestess priestesses of Danae. Also the Hydra, the water creature, a college of rain-making priestesses. So who is Danae? Danae was a princess of Argos in the Greek Peloponnese, the only child of King Acrisius, 
when her father learned a prophecy that was he was destined to be killed by a son of his daughter, he locked Danae away in a subterranean bronze chamber or windowless tower, save for an oculus. Her prison, however, was infiltrated by the god Zeus, who impregnated her in the guise of a golden shower. She conceived and bore a son named Perseus. As soon as her father learned of this, he placed Danae in, and the infant in a chest and set them adrift at sea. By the providence of the gods, they made it safely to the island of Seraphos, where the fisherman Dictus offered them refuge in his home. Later, when Perseus was fully grown, King Polydectes of Seraphos sought Danae for his wife, and wishing to rid himself of her son, commanded Perseus fetch the gorgon's head. The hero returned victorious, only to learn that his mother had fled to the temple of Athena, seeking refuge from the king. In anger, Perseus turned Polydectes and his allies to stone with the gorgon's head. He then traveled with his mother to Argos to claim his grandfather's throne. He later inadvertently killed his father in a discus accident. She is the mother of Perseus, the slayer of Medusa. Danae was the goddess of earth, moon, water, agriculture, especially barley, inspirer of the inventions of irrigation and well digging. <coughs> the mother of peoples, earth suffering from drought, ancestress of the Rutulians, the aboriginal Romans. Sacred to her were the milkweed, beloved by the monarch butterflies. They are also called the Danae, the Danae Day. And sacred to her were the colors yellow, black, white, green, and gold. Barley, the shower of gold, i.e. the riches of harvest, or it may refer to rain as necessary to the harvest, or may refer to a ritual marriage between the moon and sun, the brazen tower or dungeon with brazen doors, the sieve for rain-making magic. Here is Queen Elizabeth with the sacred sieve. And Danae receiving the golden shower of Zeus. The Argive genealogy. Here is Io. Io is the white goddess in cow form. Here's Danaeus and his daughter Hytemnestra, ancestor of Danae, and Zeus, Perseus. Here is Zeus impregnating Danae when coming to her in a shower of gold. It's an example of the marriage of heaven and earth. She is the barley goddess. You see many representations of Danae being impregnated by Zeus. This is a very important moment to the elites. And here is Sting's song in honor of her. She was a princess of Argos, the white goddess. The word Argos itself means shimmering white and is the conventional ad adjective to describe the white priestly vestments, like the white coats of the medical priesthood today, perhaps. It's the moment of conception of Perseus, the controller of Medusa medicine. Here's Danae and her son Perseus uh, being rescued by the net of the fisherman Dictus. So da Danae represents the watery flow of currency, the mar of maritime law. Danu means primeval waters. Danu is also a goddess in the Rig Veda. Dawn is the great mother of the Mabinagion. Danu, Dano, da, Danand, the Proto Indo European root meant fluid, river, waters. Rhea, she who flows. Danu is the hypothetical mother goddess of the Tuatha de Danan. Old Irish, the peoples of the god goddess Danu. 
Alternate names are Anu, Ana, Anan, wealth and abundance. Here are the female telkines from Rhodes. So before they were the the uh, male priests of Rhodes, they were the female priestess of Rhodes. The goddess of water and ag agriculture. Uh, let's see. They were the inventors of the useful arts, the bronze working goddess. They forged Cronus's tooth sickle tooth sickle and Poseidon's trident. They were regarded as sorcerers, envious demons with the power of controlling the destructive elements. Disease control. Hydra, the water creature, was the fifty-headed goddess personification of the Gallic College of the Danaides. Hydra of Lerna is a serpentine water monster. Its lair was the lake of Lerna in Argos, the site of the myth of the Danaides. Lerna was reputed to be an entrance to the underworld, killed by Hercules as the second of his twelve labors. The Hydra was reared by Hera, our lady, to specifically slay Hercules. And of course, we're seeing the Hydra show up in our COVID vaccines, apparently. Britain was formerly called Albion. It was first attested in the anonymous Anglo-Norman poem called Des Grants Gens. It appeared as it appeared as a prologue to the brute chronicles of Geoffrey of Monmouth in his book Historia Regnum Britanniae, written in 1136, that tells when Brutus of Troy arrived on the island that had been revealed to him in the prophecy of Diana. Diana says, Brutus, there lies beyond the Gallic bounds an island which the western sea surrounds, by giants once possessed, now few remain, to bar thy entrance, or obstruct thy reign, to reach that happy shore thy sails employ, their fate decrees to raise a second Troy, and found an empire in thy royal line, which time shall ne'er destroy, nor bounds confine. So, the British matriarchal legend, the Albina narrative, gave way to the attribution of British origins to the warrior Brutus. Albina is a manipulation of the Hypermnestra story of the Fifty Deniades. The story of Albina and her sisters, as told by Gog Magog, the last giant. The story begins 3,970 years after the world began. In Greece there was a king who was the most powerful king on earth. He was exceptionally tall, and married a beautiful wife, who was also exceptionally tall, the white sow goddess. She bore him thirty daughter, daughters, the oldest and tallest, whose name was Albina. They were married off to kings, but resented their subordinate status, and plotted to murder their husbands. The plot was revealed by the youngest daughter, who loved her husband. The sisters were exiled on a rudderless boat with no sails and after three days reached the uninhabited land, later to be known as Britain. The eldest daughter, Albina, was the first to step ashore and lay claim to the land, naming it after herself. At first the women gathered acorns and fruits, but once they learned to hunt and obtain meat, it aroused their lecherous desires. As no other humans inhabited the land, they mated with evil spirits called incubi, engendering a race of giants. These giants are evidenced by huge bones which are unearthed. Brutus arrives in two, 260 years after Albina, 1136 years before the birth of Christ, but by then there were only 24 giants left due to inner strife. As with Geoffrey of Monmouth's version, Brutus's band subsequently overtake the land, defeating Gog Magog in the process. 
So could the thirty daughters at the genesis of Albion be a reflection of the thirty piglets of the white sow who guided Aeneas to Albalonga? Incubus, its imaginary being or demon causing nightmares in male form consorting with women in their sleep. Incubo, nightmare, one who lies down on, the sleeper. It's also related to the word incubation, which is Asclepius's form of healing, incubation. Cubicle, to incubate. The bedroom, the cubare, to lie down. One of the earliest mentions of an incubus comes from Mesopotamia on the Sumerian king list, where the hero Gilgamesh's father is listed as Lilu, Lilu who wanders the plain. A Lilu is a masculine Akkadian word for a spirit related to Alu, demon. Lilu is the counterpart of Lilith and was the only other one who matched her sexual appetite and vengeance on the children of Adam and Eve for the sting of betrayal. Lilith is the queen of the night. Ardat Lili is the night demon. So, let's see, Lamashtu is a malevolent goddess kidnapped children while they were breastfeeding. She would gnaw on their bones and suck their blood, bringing nightmares, killing foliage, infesting rivers, lakes, and being a bringer of disease and sickness and death. Disease control magic. Lilu is the male counterpart of the demoness Lilitu. Lilith refused to submit to Adam and escaped the garden to become a child-harming demon, just as Albina and her sisters refused to submit to their husbands. Lilith's incubation in the Bible. Her towers, her towers will be overgrown with thorns and her fortresses with thistles and briars. She will become a haunt for jackals and the abode for ostriches. The desert creature will meet with the hyenas, and one wild goat will call to another. There the night creature will settle and find her place of repose. There the owl will make her nest. She will lay and hatch her eggs and gather her brood under her shadow. Even there the birds of prey will gather, each with its mate. So she's only mentioned once in the Bible as the screech owl. The incubus and succubus are actually the same. They swap genders at specific points. For example, they would become succubi whenever they required semen for their life source. They would then become incubi and use the semen to impregnate women. Many believe that incubi are bisexual, but that would strictly contradict their purpose of impregnation. Some people believe that when an the incubi slept with another male, he would absorb his seed and use it as his own. Sometimes these demons were able to conceive children. When they do, they will obtain supernatural abilities. This human incubi or succubi hybrid is called a cambion. So here is an incubus alien fetus. Here, Albion swaps gender. This is from uh, William Blake's Jerusalem, the emanation of the great giant Albion. The longest and greatest of Blake's prophetic books, Jerusalem tells the story of the fall of Albion, Blake's embodiment of man, Britain, or the Western world as a whole. Characters morph in and out of each other. A character can be a person and a place. Jerusalem the emanation of Albion is a woman and a city. Albion, the universal humanity, is a man and a land, Britain. He contains twelve sons who co inherit with the twelve tribes of Israel. This is the Alp Drukhen, the incubus. So the giant Gogmagog is the offspring of Albina, 
and the incubus, Nilitu and Lilo. I wonder if Julius is a patronymic surname built upon Lilo. The gens Julia was one of the most ancient patrician families in ancient Rome. First of the family to obtain the consulship was Gaius Julius Iulus, ancestor of Julius Caesar. The Julii were of Alban origin. Iulus, the mythical ancestor of the race, was the same as Ascanius, the son of Aeneas and founder of Alba Longa. Aeneas, in turn, was the son of Venus and Anchises. Lilu founds Albion, and Ilius founds Alba. The gens was always said to have descended from a mythical personage named Iulus or Iulus, even before he was a asserted to be the son of Aeneas. Lilibeth is a nickname for Elizabeth, the house of Lilu or Lilitu. On the 14th of January, 1559, the eve of her coronation, Elizabeth I processed from the Tower of London to Westminster in a cloth of gold-covered litter carried by two mules. The procession made its final stop at Temple Bar, which was dressed finely with two images of Gog Magog, the Albion, and Corineus, the Briton, the two giants bigger in statue, stature, holding a tablet with verses written in Latin. So here is the Albion, Gog Magog, and the Briton, who is Corineus, the slayer of Gog Magog. I wonder if Corin is related to the Corinthian. The Lord Mayor's account of Gog Magog says that the Roman Emperor Diocletian had thirty-three wicked daughters. He found thirty-three husbands for them to curb their wicked ways. They chaffed at this, and under the leadership of his eldest sister Alba they murdered their husbands. For this crime they were set adrift at sea. They washed ashore on a windswept, I windswept island, which they named Albion, after Alba. Here they coupled with demons and gave birth to the race of giants whose descendants include Gog and Magog. They are Cambians. Here they are adorning Guild Hall in London. The giants stand for London, said to be assisting Ireland after the famine by purchasing land to improve trade. And here's Gog and Magog adorning a Melbourne arcade. And right here you have Alba, always the presence of the white goddess. The Gog prophecy is meant to fulfill at the approach of what is called the end of days, but not necessarily the end of the world. Jewish eschatology viewed Gog and Magog as the enemies to, to be defeated by the Messiah, which would usher in the age of the Messiah. Uh, here are the generations of Noah, and Magog is the son of Japheth. Magog is said to be the first king of Sweden, And here he is in Irish genealogy. According to several medieval, medieval Irish chronologies, chrono chronicles, most notably the labor, Gabala Aaron, the Irish race are a composite including descendants of Japheth's son, Magog, from Scythia. They are the Scythians, or Scythians. Centuries later, Jewish tradition changed Ezekiel's Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog, which is the form in which they appear in the Christian New Testament's Book of Revelation.
and I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. They were holding back the four winds of the earth, so they would not blow thither on the sea nor against the trees. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So Gog and Magog are people walled off by Alexander's forces, the gates of Alexander, a legendary barrier supposedly built by Alexander the Great in the Caucasus to keep the uncivilized barbarians of the north, typically associated with Gog and Magog. Josephus, a Jewish historian of the first century, is known to have written of Alexander's gates, designed to be a barrier against the Scythians. See, the people of whom the Greek called Scythians were known among Jews as Magogites, descendants of Magog in the Hebrew Bible. They are also known as Yajuj and Majuj. They are suppressed by the dual Car Carnain, the two-horned one, traditionally regarded as Alexander the Great. The devil, Gog and Magog, attack the holy city. And here, they look like swine. And they are cannibals. Here is the attack of Gog and Magog, the beginning of Christ's millennial reign. And I will leave it at that for now. See you in a bit. Welcome back to part three of this torturously long and halting presentation. If you've made it this far, I commend you. Let's uh, continue looking at some aspects of the White Goddess. Her name is Alfito. She is the Harvest Goddess. Danae is a title of the White Goddess. Some of her various names are Albina, Cardea, Danae, Demeter, Io, Leprea, Leucothea, and Persephonea. Uh, linguistic note, the word Alpdruk in the Nightmare or Incubus is connected with her name. Alphos means dull white leprosy, Latin albus, alfiton, pearl barley. She was originally the white goddess of the barley flower, the hag of the mill. So here's the uh, millstone, and it looks like a swastika. Cardea of the North Star, the hinge of the sky. And here's another millstone. Alfito, the white goddess, is Demeter. The Greek goddess of harvest is the mother of barley, Danan, the barley goddess of Argos. Iao, the white cow aspect of the barley goddess with Juno and Jupiter. So that is reflecting the um, Hyades and Aldebaran in Taurus. And also recall that the Egyptian Book of the Dead calls Orion, uh, Smati Ori Osiris, the barley god. The white sow goddess, here is Demeter with the white sow. The Celts associated the sow with the cycles of birth and death, regeneration, the moon, and the underworld. And here she is as the harvest goddess sowing the seeds. So is, or sow, is both a noun for the female pig and verb for planting seeds. In the Eleusinian Mysteries, a secret cult devoted to Demeter, the rites honored the annual cycle of death and rebirth of grain in the fields. The resurrection of seeds buried in the ground inspired the faith that similar resurrection might await the human body laid to rest in the earth. And here we have in the Aeneid the white sow, 
portends the founding of Alba Longa with the thirty piglets, which is reflected in the thirty sisters of Albina. And recall also that the Hyades were called Succulae, the little pigs, from Sus Sow. Some believe Jesus means earth pig. And we have Circe, who also changed Odysseus's men into swine. Carithwen is the white sow goddess of wealth, Welsh medieval legend. She was the mother of the hideous son Morvan and a beautiful daughter, Creerwy. Her name is composed of the words Caird and Hwen. Hwen means white, and Caird in Welsh means gain. Also, the inspired arts, especially poetry, like the Greek words Cerdos and Cerdea, from which derive the Latin Cerdo, a craftsman. Cerda also means pig. So here's her story. Carithwen's son, Morvan, utter darkness, was the most ill-favored man. To compensate for his ugliness, Carithwen decides to make him an all-wise by brewing him a magical cauldron of inspiration, Awen. According to the arts of the Firilt, the alchemists or metal workers, the Telkines, the cauldron must brew for a year and a day, and Carithwen sets two people to tend it while she goes out gathering herbs, a blind man called Morda, and a child named Guyenbach. On the last day, three drops of liquid fly out from the cauldron and bird Guyen's fig finger. He puts it to his mouth and gains the three gifts of poetic inspiration, prophecy, and shape-shifting. With his gift of prophecy, Guyan knows that Carithwen will try to kill him, so he uses his shape-shifting ability to flee in the shape of a hare. Carithwen pursues him in the form of a greyhound bitch, so he turns into a fish. She transforms into an otter bitch. He becomes a bird and she a hawk. He becomes a grain of wheat and hides on a threshing floor, but Carithwen becomes a black hen and swallows him. After nine months, Guyan is reborn in the womb of Carithwen, who cannot bear to kill him by reason of his great beauty. So she ties him in a leather bag and throws him into the sea on the eve of May Eve. On May Day morning, the bag is pulled from the weir and opened. <coughs> The first person to look upon the beautiful baby says, Behold, a radiant brow. And so the child takes the name Taliasan, Taliasin, which in Welsh means radiant brow. Taliasin is immediately able to compose perfect impromptu verse by virtue of the awen received from Carithwen's cauldron. He goes on to achieve fame as primary chief bard in Britain. So here is the symbol of the Awen. It's also a symbol of ritual androgyny. And we see it uh, reflected in the, ups in the inverted Jesuit logo. Alfito, the German word Alpdruken, the nightmare or incubus, is connected with her name and the Greek word Alphos, leprosy and Alphiton, pearl barley. Here's Alfito, the Arcadian Danan of Argos, the white sow grain goddess, cognate with Demeter, sacred to her the sow and the Irish Beth Louise Nyon writing system. The goddess Leprea a.k.a. Scabby, is the founders and ep eponym of the leper colony known as Lepreus, close to the river Alpheus. Her sole prerogative is to inflict or heal leprosy. The thank offering for a cure should be a measure of barley. Um, an alternate name for Alfito possessed the Antipathes stone, which inflicted or healed leprosy. And here we have... Uh, an aspect of disease control through the white goddess. In one sense, it is the pleasant whiteness of pearl barley or a woman's body or milk or unsmudged snow. In another, it is the horrifying whiteness of a corpse or a scepter 
or leprosy. Alfito has been shown combined with these senses, for alphos is white leprosy, the vert vitiliginous sort which attacks the face, and alfiton is barley. Alfito lived on the cliff tops of Nonacris in perpetual snow. So Robert Graves describes the whiteness of the goddess as a dichotomy, the, J the Janus effect. Nonacris was part of the state of Phineas. So here we have the Phoenicians come in. It was located near a cliff from which water thought to be that of Styx trickled. And the river Styx is one of the five rivers of Hades, the river of hatred. So Alfito lives at the source of hate. Phineas is a village and former municipality in Corinthia. Styx originated from Phineas. Phineas lies at the foot of Mount Silene, or Kylene, the mythical birth, birthplace of the god Hermes and his mother Maya. So here it is. Here is Mount Kylene. And here's Corinthia we'll be looking at soon. Arethusa, the waterer, the white goddess of the moon, spring waters and immortality, she who is the source of the poet's inspiration. The myth of her transformation begins in Arcadia, where she accidentally bathed in the river god Alpheus. She was pursued by the god Alpheus, whitish, as she wished to remain chaste, attendant of Artemis, she appealed to Artemis, the high source of water, for help. Artemis hid her in an unfolding mist and transformed her into a spring. He became a river. The Roman writer Ovid called Arethusa by the name Alphaeus because her stream was believed to have a subterranean communication with the river god Alphaeus. The Alpheus River was famous to Hercules to clean the Augean stables. And here's the river right here, Alpheus. It's a very famous river. The Lord of the Underground Stream. Leucothea is the white goddess of the sea. She was Eno, the mortal queen of Boeotia, nurse of Dionysus, and she dumped, jumped into the sea to escape her mad husband, Athamas, and was transformed into the goddess Leucothea. Here she is saving Odysseus from a storm. Here's Boeotia, right above Corinthia. Leucipe is the white mare uh, aspect of the barley goddess. She is re closely related to Artemis Orthea, and both goddesses possess the Antipathes stone, the resistor. This stone had the power to inflict and heal leprosy. So our doctors today probably possess this Antipathes stone somehow. Leucothea is the goddess of the moon, she who strikes forth inspirational springs with her moon-shaped hoof healer of rep leprosy. Sacred to her are the bat, the horse, the golden mechanical boar, the leprosy-curing stone, Atipathes. And Orthea is the upright goddess, she who causes erection and heals the sick, she who causes and cures leprosy. Here we have the festival of Leucipa, the Agrionia, provocation to savagery, the annual atonement for the death of Hippasus, in which women pretend to seek Dionysus, and then having agreed he must be away with the muses, sit in a circle and ask riddles. When the worship of Dionysus was introduced into Boeotia, and while the other women and maidens were reveling and ranging over the mountains in Bacchic joy, these sisters alone remained at home devoting themselves to their usual occupations. Dionysus drove them mad with cannibalistic desire. In this state of madness, they were eager to honor the god, and Leucipa, who was chosen by law to offer a sacrifice to Dionysus, gave up her own son, Hippasus, whom the sisters tore to pieces. 
The sisters afterwards roamed over the mountains in a frenzy, until at last Hermes changed them into bats. They were called the Miniades. And we know about the bats as being the origin of the coronavirus in 2020. Marapesa, Marapesa is another name of the white sow, barley goddess, the snatcher, goddess of grain, ruler of midwinter, the white sow of death, causer and healer of leprosy. The white sow's milk was held to cause leprosy. In mortal form, she is said to have committed suicide after the death of her consort, Idas. Here's the actress Marpesa Don. In Hindu mythology, there is a sow goddess called Varahi, with the head of a sow. She is the Shakti, feminine energy of Varaha, the boar avatar of the god Vishnu. In Shaktism, goddess worship, she is usually worshipped at night, using secretive Vama Marga tantric practices of the left-hand path. So here's what Robert Graves has to say about Cardea. The Latins worshipped the white goddess as Cardea, and Ovid tells a muddled story about her in his Fasti, connecting her with the word cardo, a hinge. He says that she was the mistress of Janus, the two-headed god of doors, and the first month of the year first of the and of the first month of the year and had charge over door hinges she also protected infants against witches disguised as formidable night birds who snatched children from their cradles and sucked their blood he says that she exercised this power first at alba the white city which was colonized by emigrants from peloponnese at the time of the great dispersal and from which rome was colonized and that her principal prophylactic instrument was the hawthorn. Ovid's story is inside out, however. Cardeo is Alfito, the white goddess who destroyed children after disguising herself in bird or beast form, and the hawthorn, which was sacred to her, might not be introduced into a house, lest she destroyed the children inside. It was Janus, the stout guardian of the oak door, who kept out Cardea and her witches, for Janus was really the oak god Dianus, who was incarnate in the king of Rome, and afterwards in the Flamen Dialis, his spiritual successor. And his wife Jana was Diana, Dione, the goddess of the woods and of the moon. Janus and Jana were in fact a rustic form of Jupiter and Juno. But before Janus or Dianus, or Jupiter married Jana, or Diana, or Juno, and put her under subjugation. He was her son, and she was the white goddess Cardea. So here's Janus and Jana, or Dianus and Diana. He was the oak king. And here's Iana or Jana as the white goddess. They were a set of divine twins, two sides of nature, mortal and immortal, past and future, time and movement, two pillars on the east side of the Roman temple, sun and moon. Here the pillars are joined as one with two heads. Let's see. I'll start right here. Cardo, the hinge, is the same word as Cardo, craftsman. In Irish myth, the god of craftsmen, who specialized in hinges, locks, and rivets, was called Credne, the craftsman who originally claimed the goddess Cardo, or Cardea, as his patroness. Thus, as Janus's mistress, Cardea was given the task of keeping from the door the nursery bogey, who in matriarchal times was her own august self and who was propitiated at Roman weddings with torches of hawthorn. Ovid says of Cardea, apparently quoting a religious formula, her power is to open what is shut, and to shut what is open. Here's Credne. He was the son of Brigid, and the goldsmith of the Tuatha de Danan. He also worked with bronze and brass. Here's Brigid as the triple goddess, whom the poets adored, 
her two sisters, Bridget the Healer and Bridget the Smith. She was syncretized as Saint Bridget. So the triple goddess, the new moon is the white goddess of birth, the full moon is the red goddess of love and battle, and the old moon, the black goddess of death and divination. And we see the triple goddess reflected in the Bible as the three Marys. <coughs> so the triple goddess as the solar mother, lunar daughter, and crone, time. The mother and daughter, or maiden, are typified as Demeter and Persephone. Indeed, the name Demeter means God the mother, or mother god, while Persephone was known as Kore, which simply means maiden or daughter, mother and maiden aspects of the triple goddess. But what of Crone? The term Crone does not originally signify old woman. Crone comes from the Greek chronos, meaning time. Thus, the significance of Crone is identical to that of Kali, which comes from Sanskrit Kala, also meaning time. So Kali and Crone are the same. The three persons of Dea are respectively the creatrix, the preserver, and the destroyer of worlds, reflected in the triple figures of the three fates, the Greek more, or Teutonic norns, who are respectively the spinner, the weaver, and the destroyer of the threads of life. So here is chapter 10 of The White Goddess by Robert Graves, and he talks about the Hawthorne. The sixth tree of the tree calendar is the White Thorn, or Hawthorn, or May, which takes its name from the month of May. It is, in general, an unlucky tree, and the name under which it appears in the Irish Brehan Laws, Skeeth, is apparently connected with the Indo-Germanic room Skeeth, root Skeeth, or Skeeth, meaning harm, from which derive the English Skeeth, or the Greek Eschethes. Let me get the Scythians. In ancient Greece, as in Britain, this was the month in which people went about in old clothes, a custom referred to in the proverb, ne'er cast a clout where air may be out, meaning do not put on new clothes until the unlucky month is over, and not necessarily referring to the variability of the English climate. The proverb is, in fact, also current in northeastern Spain, where in general settled hot weather has come by Easter. They also abstain from sexual intercourse, a custom which explains May as an unlucky month for marriage. In Greece and Rome, May was the month in which the temples were swept out and the images of gods washed, the month of preparation for the midsummer festival. The Greek goddess Maya, though she is represented in English poetry as ever fair and young, took her name from Maya, grandmother. She was a malevolent beldame whose son Hermes conducted souls to hell. She was, in fact, the white goddess, who, under the name of Cardea, as has been noticed, cast spells with the hawthorn. The Greeks propitiated her at marriages, marriage being considered hateful to the goddess, with five torches of hawthorn wood, and with the hawthorn blossoms before the unlucky month began. Maya is crone, the grandmother. Her name is related to Maya, an honorific term for older women related to Mater, mother. Maya embodied the concept of growth, as her name is related to the adjective Mayus, Mayor, the larger or greater. Her identity became intertwined with the goddess Terra, Fauna, Ops, Juno, Karna, and the Magna Mater, the great goddess referring to the Roman Kybel. The Maiores, the ancestors, again from the adjective Maius, Maior meaning those who are greater in terms of generational precedence. On the first day of May, the flamen of Vulcan sacrificed a pregnant sow to Maya, a customary offering to an earth goddess. Again, compare Jesus, earth pig. Cardea seated near the silver gate. And she is an aspect of Vulcan, which makes her a Chthonic goddess, 
goddess of the underworld. And Maya is the daughter of Atlas and Pleione, the Oceanid, and is the oldest of the seven Pleiades, sisters to the Hyades. They were born on Mount Kylene in Arcadia. And of course, you have Elon Musk's mother, Maya. Maya is the goddess of growth and gain, the daughter of Atlas and the mother of Hermes, which makes her the grandmother of the Lares. The Lares are the good spirits of the departed versus the Lemures of the, or, or the Larvae. So on May 15th, the Ides, Mercury was honored as a patron of merchants and increaser of profit through an etymological connection with Merks, Merkes, goods and merchandise, another possible connection with Maya, his mother, as a goddess who promoted growth. So that's why we see uh, commercial medicine uses the staff of Hermes. So who is Lara? Her tongue was cut out as punishment for her betrayal of Jupiter's secret amours. Lara thus becomes Muta, the speechless one. Mercury leads her to the underworld, the abode of the dead. In this place of silence she is Dea Tacita, the silent one. En route he impregnates her. She gives birth to twin boys, as silent or speechless as she. In this context, the lares can be understood as manes of silence, tacite manes. The demanes are chthonic deities sometimes thought to represent souls of the deceased loved ones. Here is Lara de Amuta, celebrated on the Ides of May. The Lares were tutelary spirits of the household hearth, but also Lares belonging to the whole city. They were guardians of the crossroads, or Compita. There were always two Lares, Compitales, at these chapels of the crossways, one for each intersecting road. They were always invoked with their mother, Lara, or Mania, at the Compitalia festival. Swine were offered up, of course. So another name for Lara is Mania. Mania is the goddess of chaos, insanity, of, and the dead. She was the ruling monarch of the underworld alongside Mantus, her consort. She is the matriarch of spirits who dwell in the night and of ghosts who haunt the world of the living. Mania, the goddess of the underworld, used to reference terrible diseases. She is Tacita, the silent one, mother of the Lares, household deities of the crossroads. crossroads. Woolen effigies eventually replaced human sacrifice. Goddess of mad rage, mad, Madha. And of course, the silent one invokes Harpocrates. So Coca-Cola's famous hilltop commercial was the mega ritual to Mania, or Lara. In the commercial, a camera pans across the faces of all shapes and colors and ethnicities as they sing from a hilltop in Manziana, Italy. I'd like to buy the world a Coke. Manziana is just outside Rome. It derives its name from the Etruscan god of the underworld, Manth, and his presence was perceived by the Etruscans in geysers and volcanic springs across the region. Uh, recalling Maya and Vulcan. So Mantus, consort of Mania. And this ritual was recently revived on the last episode of Mad Men. Of Mad Rage. Rage. Is Coca-Cola one of their potions used in disease control and human sacrifice? What is it with this shape that they created on this hilltop? You see the same shape uh, shown in this video by Fleetwood Mac, Tusk. And this is Vatica, the Etruscan god of the underworld, another goddess of the underworld, and you see this shape right here. And there are many 
etymologies that I've come across for Vatican, which we'll get to in the future. But here's the lyrics. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love, grow apple trees and honeybees and snow-white turtle doves. And that is a symbol of human sacrifice. And keep it company. Who is the company? The Jesuits are known as the company. And recently, Crystal Time pointed out that kola is a suffix meaning worshipper. Back to Hawthorn. Hawthorn. The aesthetic use of the thorn, which corresponds with the cult of the goddess Cardea, must, however, be distinguished from the later orgiastic use, which corresponds with the cult of the goddess Flora, which accounts for the English medieval habit of riding out on May morning to pluck flowering hawthorn boughs and dance around the maypole. Hawthorn blossom has, for many men, a strong scent of female sexuality, which is why the Turks use a flowering branch as an erotic symbol. This flora cult was introduced into the British Isles in the late 1st century BC by the second Belgic invaders. Further, that the Glastonbury thorn, which flowered on Old Christmas Day, January 5th, was cut down by the Puritans at the Revolution, was a sport of the common hawthorn. The monks of Glastonbury perpetuated it and sanctified it with an improving tale about Joseph of Arimathea's staff and the crown of thorns as a means of discouraging the orgiastic use of hawthorn blossom, which normally did not appear until May Day. Hawthorn can be woven into a, a growing fence called a hedgerow. And here's the famous uh, Led Zeppelin lyric in Stairway to Heaven. It's also called the Crataegus, the hawthorn, quickthorn, thorn apple, may tree, white thorn, or hawberry. Crataegus is divine from, derived from Kratos, strength, and Achis, sharp. Here's the later orgiastic cult of Flora, which overlaid the ascetic cult of Cardea. In Welsh mythology, the hawthorn appears as a malevolent chief of the giants, Ispadadan Penquar, the father of Olwen, she of the white track, another name of the white goddess. In the romance of Kilwich and Olwen, Kilwich was also was so called because he found he was found in a swine's burrow. Giant, the giant hawthorn puts all possible obstacles in his way of Kilwich. Kilwich's marriage to Owen and demands a dowry of thirteen treasures, all apparently impossible to, to secure. The giant lived in a castle guarded by nine porters and nine watchdogs, proof of the strength of the taboo against marriage in the Hawthorne month. So he completes his impossible tasks with the help of King Arthur. She is the goddess of the Milky Way. So we have elements of the swine and the hawthorn and the white goddess in this tale. Hawthorn is seen as a traditional use in herbal medicine. It's tonic for the heart, the valerian of the heart, cardia, cardio, coronary. Coronary pertains to a crown, the corona or wreath. Its anatomical use is from the 1670s in reference to the blood vessels that supply a muscular substance of the heart and surround it like a crown. The coronary heart. Here is Jesus's heart with the corona and a wreath of hawthorn around it. It is said that Moses spoke to God on Mount Horeb through a species of hawthorn Crataegus Pyracantha and is the burning bush really just a hawthorn bush? I found this interesting Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, the location of the story of Moses and the burning bush, where the Ten Commandments were, commandments were given to Moses by Yahweh. But it was but was it Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai? John Calvin took the view that Sinai and Horeb were the same mountain, 
only it had two tops which bore these different names. Horeb is thought to mean the glowing heat, which seems to be a reference to the sun, while Sinai may have been derived from the name Sin, the Sumerian deity of the moon. Thus Sinai and Horeb would be mountains of the moon and sun, respectively. So the hawthorn is also the royal tree of the Tudor house. He found his crown in the hawthorn bush. Cleave to thy crown, though it hangs from a bush. Here are some oracles of hawthorn. So let's talk about Carnea and Cranea of Corinth. Why is Corinth so important to this cult? Corinth is, here's Greece, and where are we are we? Here we are. Here's Corinth right here, the Isthmus of Corinth. Carnea is generally identified with the Roman goddess Crane, who is really Cranea, the harsh or stony one, a Greek surname of the goddess Artemis, whose hostility to children had constantly to be appeased. Cranea owned a hilltop temple near Delphi, in which the office of priest was always held by a boy for a five-year term, and a cypress grove, the Craneum, just outside Corinth, where Bellerophon had a hero shrine. Crane means rock and it's etymologically connected with the Gaelic cairn, which has come to mean a pile of stones erected on a mountain top. So here's the Cranaean Plains. This is from um, Assassin's Creed. And here's Bellerophon killing the Chimera. Pyrene was the naiad nymph of a fountain in the city of Corinthos. She was abducted to the site of the town by the god Poseidon. Their sons Laches and Cancreas were the eponymous founders of the city's twin ports, one on each side of the isthmus. When Cancreas was unintentionally killed by Artemis, Pyrenees' grief was so profound that she became nothing but tears and turned into the Pyrenee fountain outside the gates of Corinth. The fountain was sacred to the muses, and it was there that Bellerophon found Pegasus drinking and tamed him. So here are the two ports, the Lacayon in the Gulf of Corinth and Cancrea in the Saronic Gulf. St. Corona, you will recall from my first videos about her, is related to the uh, Corinth by her manner of execution. It reflects that of the Corinthian pine bender, Sinus. And Sinus was the Ithmian bandit who guarded the portal to the underworld at, underworld at Corinth. He w tied people to two pine trees that bent down to the ground and then let the trees go, tearing the victims apart. This led him to be called Pitiocampus, the pine bender. He was slain by Theseus. In a Corinthian myth, myth recounted to Pausanias in the 2nd century AD, Bri Briareus, one of the Hecatonchires, <laughs> or the hundred-handed, was the arbitrator in, dis in a dispute between Poseidon and Helios, between the sea and the sun. His verdict was that the Isthmus of Corinth belonged to Poseidon, and, and the Acropolis of Corinth, the Acrocorinth, belonged to Helios. So this is the Acra Corinth, the Upper Corinth, the Acropolis of ancient Corinth. It's a monolithic rock, the Crane, overseeing the ancient city of Corinth, Greece. It was a fortress that commanded the Isthmus of Corinth. It went through Byzantine, Frankish, and Venetian and Ottoman hands. It was rebuilt by the Venetians. Here's the uh, Venetian lion over the gates. And here's some uh, archaeology theater. Here's the Acre Corinth in Assassin's Creed. 
The highest peak on the site was home to a temple of Aphrodite. The temple was converted to a church, which in turn was converted to a mosque. It was famous for its alleged temple of prostitution. It originally housed a statue of Aphrodite staring at her reflection in the shield of Ares. The whores of Corinth were famous. They were the heteri. They were courtesans, highly educated, sophisticated companions. Although most engaged in sexual relationships with their patrons, the hetere were not simple prostitutes. This was the famous lace of Corinth. Aphrodite was the protector deity of the city of Corinth. She had at least three sanctuaries in the city, the temple of Aphrodite at the Acro Corinth, the Temple of Aphrodite II, and the Temple of Aphrodite Cranion. Cancrea served as the east eastern trade route via the Saronic Gulf. Lacaion was the Corinthian Gulf, served the trade routes leading to Italy and the rest of Europe. It was situated on the eastern side of the Isthmus of Corinth. Cancrea sat at the natural crossroads for ships arriving from the east. Here's the trade routes, and here's the famous canal. I saw this map, and I saw Gok. I was wondering if it was related to the uh, Gog and Magog. And you'll remember M Ricardo Montalban, who did the Corinthian leather commercials here holding the key. But the maidens of Corinth were above all famous because the city was a second paphos. The verb I corinthize, so to speak, means to have sex with a prostitute. And when Plato says the man who wants to keep fit should not have a mistress, he uses the word Corinthian girl. In Corinth, the most famous site for sacred marriage was the temple of Aphrodite Melanus at Cranion. The inscription document the existence of over a thousand prostitutes in service here at the time of the Persian Wars. It could even be the lost version of the tale of Vitruvius tells the Corinthian girl actually was a sacred prostitute. Let's see, the acanthus, on the other hand, while of course it means the plant, has many tropes emphasizing the plant's prickliness. It means thorn or prickle. So this is the Corinthian column with the acanthus leaves. Acanthus is very similar to the hawthorn leaves. It also had pharmaceutical uses to treat asthma, diabetes, leprosy, hepatitis, snake bites, and rheumatoid arthritis. And also in Assassin's Creed we have this temple to Medusa. So Cor Corinth was a second Paphos. Paphos is on Cyprus where uh, Galatea is from. In its founding myth, the town's name is linked to the goddess Aphrodite, as the eponymous Paphos was the son or daughter of Pygmalion, whose ivory cult image of Aphrodite was brought to life by the goddess as milk-white Galatea. So we have two Aphrodites. We have the Aphrodite of Paphos, Paphos, which is Galactic or Galatea, and the Black Aphrodite of Corinth, who is the Chthonic goddess, the dark aspect of the goddess of love as underworld deity. And of course, Paphos is UNESCO World Heritage Site. The two Aphrodites are Aphrodite Pandemos and Aphrodite Urania. Aphrodite Pandemos, common to all the people, was daughter of Zeus and Dione, of the cult of Dodona, the goddess of the many. She was the goddess of family, political life, and society. Courtesans were put under her protection. The sacrifices to her were consisted of white goats. And Aphrodite Urania signifies the universal, the divine, the heavenly spiritual love. She was the daughter of Uranus, the sky god, born of his genitals after they had emerged from the sea, the sea foam and she washed ashore at Paphos. So Melena and 
Galatea. We get our word pandemic, pandemic from Aphrodite Pandemos, incident to the whole people, diseases pertaining to all the people, public, common. And it's distinguished from epidemic, which may connote a limitation to a smaller area, a pandemic disease. Synonyms for pandemic are Catholic, empire, total, all-embracing, ecumenical, global, multinational, undisputed, worldwide. Pandemic. We have a pandemic of globalism, and it is Catholic. So, crane is an aspect of the black Aphrodite. Pausanias states that Corinthos had a temple of Aphrodite Melenus, or the black one. The area called the Cranion, the stony one, was a cypress grove encompassing a temple of Aphrodite Melenus, a Chthonic deity, divinity worshipped in cemeteries, just like Kali. Here's Melena, the black one, the under earth or Chthonic aspect of the Greek great goddess said to bring nightmares back to the Alpdrukan. Melania is named after Melena, the dark, the black, and here she is in her Affleck commercial channeling Lilith, among others. And here is Kali, the dark mother. Melena is cognate with the goddess Melanoe. And here is Melanoe, an aspect of Dea Muta, the silent one. And here is the Orphic hymn to Melanoe. I call upon Melanoe, the saffron-cloaked nymph of the earth, whom revered Persephone bore by the mouth of the Kokotos River, upon the sacred bed of Cronian Zeus, in the guise of Pluton Zeus, and tricked Persephone, and through wily plots bedded her, a two-bodied spectre sprang forth from Persephone's fury. The spectre drives mortals to madness with her airy apparitions, as she appears in weird shapes and strange forms, now plain to the eye, now shadowy, now shining in the darkness. All this in unnerving attacks in the gloom of night. O goddess, O queen of those below, I beseech you to banish the soul's frenzy to the ends of the earth. Show to the initiates a kindly and holy face. Melanoe means dark thought in Greek. She is the daughter of Persephone, fathered by Zeus, disguised as Hades. She is said to be half dark and half light from her dark father Hades and her mother who represented light. She walked the earth after dark with a train of ghosts bringing fear and night terrors. So, goddess of the dreaming world uh, alludes to Asclepius' incubation and Agimesis. She was born at the mouth of the cockatus, literally lamentation in the Orphic tradition. The cockatus is one of the four underworld rivers. In Inferno, the first cantica of Dante's Divine Comedy, cockatus is in the ninth and lowest circle of the underworld. So Melanoe was born in the deepest pit of hell. Here are some aspects of Melanoe, her mother, Persephone, and her father, Hades, goddess of ghosts, nightmares, necromancy, and funerary rites. Uh, Disney evokes Melanoe in the character Cruella. And here is the demon Lilith, who is portrayed as Melanoe as well, half light and half dark. And then we have Black Athena. Melanoe is described in the invocation of the Orphic hymn as Crocopeplos, clad in saffron, an epithet in ancient Greek poetry for moon goddesses. Only two goddesses are described in the hymns as Crocopeplos, Melanoe, and Hecate, who are often conflated. Here is the crocus, and the peplos is a type of robe or shawl. Here's the triple goddess Hecate and saffron cloaked Melanoe and Hecate. The Greek heterate or the courtesans 
use saffron in their perfumes, ointments, potpourris, and mascaras, divine offerings, and medical treatments. Evidence for the use of saffron in the treatments of about 90 illnesses. Hecate was associated with borders, city walls, doorways, crossroads, and realms beyond the world of the living. She was a liminal goddess between the worlds. Hecate mediated between regimes, the Olympian and the Titan, but also between mortal and divine spheres. Her cult titles, Apotropea, protects, Enodia, on the way, Propylea, before the gate, and Triodia, the crossroads, Pleiducos, the holding of the keys. Here she is bearing the torch. No Christian should make or render any devotion to the deities of the Trivium where three roads meet. Saint Elegias. So she is also known as Trivia. And we see uh, a stylized key of Hecate in our biohazard symbol. And I thought it was interesting that the uh, Swiss bank, UBS, uses three keys in its logo. Karna is Hecate is Kybel. Like many witches throughout history, Hecate was a complicated being. She was known for good and evil acts, and the story that surrounds her portray her as a complicated and dynamic figure. Her parents are said to be Persis, the god of destruction, and Asteria, the goddess of oracles or falling stars. After the fall of the Titans, she maintained her power over the earth, heaven, and sea, the triway, the ability to travel freely to and from the underworld. So this is a cairn. It's also carn, singular. And carnea, carnea, harsh or stony one. Cranea, the crone on the carn at the crossroads, a.k.a. Hecate, the stony one at the crossroads. Here is her key. Here's Trivia, Melanoe, and Hecate. Here are 33 names of Hecate. Lucifera, she bears the torch. Melena, the black one. Apotropea, the protectress, Phosphorus, the bearer of light, Orania, heavenly, Chthonia, she who is earthly and subterranean. She's all of them. The Savior, Sotira, Sotira, the Savior. Melanoe is mentioned on the Oracle Table of Pergamum, which is actually the delta of Hecate, she who changes, Amebusa, the triangular form of Pergamum, from Pergamum. Melano Melanoe appears on a bronze tablet used in magic. It was discovered at Pergamum for divination. The content of the tri triangular tablet reiterates triplicity. It depicts the three crowned goddesses, each with her head pointing at an angle and her feet pointing toward the center. The name of the goddess appears above her head, Dione, Phoebe, and Nike. Amibusa refers to the phases of the moon and is written under each of the goddesses' feet. Densely inscribed spells frame each goddess. The inscriptions around Dione and Nike are Boches Magica, incantory syllables or magical words. Melanoe appears in a triple invocation that is part of the inscription around Phoebe. Uh, esoteric symbols are inscribed on the edge of the triangle. So Phoebe is the moon, Diana, or Karna as Huntress. And Pergamum is mentioned in the Book of Revelation as the seat of Satan. It's one of the seven churches of Asia. So who is Dione? She is the Shizus. Dione was the titan goddess of the oracle of Dodona, the mother of Aphrodite, by Zeus. Her name is simply the feminine form of Zeus. Dione was described as the temple associate of Zeus at Dodona, the healer goddess and midwife of Apollo. Priestesses of her sanctuary were called doves, 
the Dodonian nymphs, or naiads. Many inscriptions recovered from the site mention both Dione and Zeus Naios, Dione Naya, Dione of the Spring. So you'll recall that the fourteen Atlantides, or the nymphs of Dodona, were comprised of the seven Hyades and the seven Pleiades, encoding Taurus and Aldebaran at the Silver Gate. And here's Fauci's branch of the NIH, NIH is called the Naiad. He's employing Naiad magic. And here, here are the doves and the sacred oak at Dodona, Dodone, where the Hellenes originated from. The Peleides, or the doves, were the sacred women of Zeus and the mother goddess Dione at the oracle of Dodona. Pindar made a reference to the Pleiades as the Peleides, a flock of doves. So Herodotus accounts the origin of Dodona, where um, two different accounts for the origin of Dodona. He writes, firstly, that he was told by the priests at Egyptian Thebes, two priestesses had been carried away from Thebes, Thebes by Phoenicians, and they were taken away and sold in Libya. And one was taken away and sold in Libya, and the other in Hellas. These women, they said, were the first founders of places of divination in the aforesaid countries. Here we have the oracle at the oasis of Siwa in Libya and Dodona in Epirus. So it's a, a triangulation of temples, Thebes, Libya, and Dodona. But this is not the triangle that I'm talking about. This is another one made with uh, Dodona and Mount Ararat. This is where Noah's Ark was said to land, and this is where Deucalion's Ark was said to land. And here's Thebes, always going back to Egypt in their fake history. The priestesses would divine the rustling of the central oak's leaves and the curring of the doves. But there's another story he was told by the prophetesses called Peleides, the doves at Dodona. Two black doves had come flying from Thebes in Egypt, one to Libya and one to Dodona. The latter one settled in the oak tree, a place of divination for Zeus. So the doves recall Aphrodite as her chariot was pulled by doves. And here's the black dove priestesses of Dodona, the Peleides. Mary is also associated with the Dove and the Holy Spirit at the Annunciation. And here's the Dodonian oak on the prow of the Argo. The Dove is commonly thought to be a symbol of peace, but is in fact an esoteric symbol of sacrifice. The use stems from its earliest uses in the Bible as burnt offering to God. So here is the burnt offering of birds, a turtle dove, or a young pigeon in Leviticus. And Genesis 15, 9, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He split each of them down the middle and laid the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Recall this from part one, the cutting of the covenant. Here's the pigeon and the dove. And the dove is also the Holy Ghost of Semiramis. Here's the dove, the Holy Ghost, as Jesus is being baptized. Also features in the Ordo Templi Orientis. And the dove and the pigeon are both known collectively as Columbidae. The name Columbia is important in this respect to the sorcerers, as it refers to the act of sacrifice, especially through fire. The dove, being something white and pure, is also a metaphor for the sacrifice of a virgin. So here is human sacrifice through gunfire at the Columbine hoax on 420. And we also have a burnt offering, dove offering, from the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster, another hoax. And Here's dove soap, 
remembered Tyler Durden's monologue in Fight Club and how the first soaps were made. Now Asian people found their clothes got cleaner if they washed them at a certain spot in the river. You know why? Human sacrifices were once made on the hills above this river. Burnt bodies. Bodies burnt. Water speeded through the wood ashes to create lye. This is lye, the crucial ingredient, the lye combined with the melted fat of the bodies, till a thick white soapy discharge crept into the river. Remember that human fat makes the best soap. Dove Soap Here is Columbia Broadcasting Corporation, named after the District of Columbia. And here is Aldebaran, the Eye of God, the Hyades, the Doves of Dodona. The Goddess Columbia sits atop the State Capitol Building in D.C. Amebusa, one that transforms, the changing one, she who changes, inscribed in the oracle table from Pergamon, dedicated to Hecate. And this equilateral triangle encodes 666, the Delta variant. There is also a sanctuary of Demeter and Kor on the Acra Corinth. Here is Demeter with the piglet and the polos crown. And there is also a sanctuary of Asclepius on the Acra Corinth, the infirmary of Asclepius, one of the most important sanctuaries in the city, whose lifespan covered more than 800 years, an open-air shrine dedicated to the cult of Apollo. A second shrine was added next to it in the 5th century dedicated to his son, Asclepius. In Sencrea, Paul had his hair cut off. So here's the port of Sencrea in the Bible, and here's all of Paul's travels. He got around. And this Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that and then said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to nearby Sancrea. There he shaved his head according to Jewish custom, marking the end of a vow. Then he will sail for Syria. So that's the, uh, the Nazarite vow. Paul also mentions Phoebe as a deacon in the church of Sancrea. She was a deaconess devoted to, uh, was to devote herself to to the care of the sick and poor women, acted as a chaperone of women in church interviews, and assisted in the baptism of women, which was originally performed on nude adults. Recall that Phoebe was one of the goddesses on the table of Pergamon, associated with Melanie. Phoebe is a first-generation titan whose consort was her brother Chaos, with whom she had two daughters, Leto, who bore Apollo and Artemis, and Astraea, a star goddess who bore her only daughter, Hecate. So Phoebe is the grandmother of Hecate. Medea, the cunning one, is also associated with Corinth. She and Jason lived there for ten years and had their children there. Medea and Medusa are both known as the cunning one. The name Medea and the word medicine share the same root with the meaning knowledge or wisdom, madha, the healing art, mada, medical science. This knowledge can be used for good or ill. Medea is the goddess of the sun and moon, the granddaughter, granddaughter of Helios, priestess of Hecate, niece of Circe, queen, witch, herbalist, divine sorceress of illumination, transformation and rebirth, healer and murderer. So Medea is of the etymology of medicine. Sacred to Medea, the yellow flowers, they grew from per Prometheus's blood in the Caucasus, and from these she distilled the drug which made Jason invulnerable to fire and iron for twenty-four hours. Aconite, the poison with which she intended to kill Theseus, juniper, with drops of which and incantations, she drugged the serpent guardian of the Golden Fleece the snake, the ram, the cauldron of rebirth and, and illumination. Also the number 14 is sacred to her. She had an annual sacrifice of 14 children. It was her festival. 
Jason and Medea, after retrieving the Golden Fleece, lived for ten years in Corinth, before he betrayed her. In one version, earlier than Euripides' play, they are said to have had fourteen children. And these, uh, let's see, the Corinthians did not want to be ruled by a woman who was a foreigner and a sorceress, so they killed her children, seven male and seven female. Uh, or they wanted to, and when the children were being pursued, they fled to the shrine of Hera Acaria and sought asylum. But the Corinthians did not spare them and killed them all upon the altar. A plague beset the city, and many were being killed by the disease. When they sought an oracle, the god replied that they should expiate the pollution of the children of Medea. From the origin of the Corinthians have the annual practice right up to our own day of having seven boys and seven girls chosen from the most prominent families to spend a year in the goddess's precinct and placate with sacrifices the wrath of the children and the anger of the goddess that originated because of them the number 14 and child sacrifice is also reflected in Niobe's seven daughters and seven sons who were killed by the poison arrows of Artemis and Apollo. And then you have the Athenians being delivered to the Minotaur in the Cretan labyrinth, seven male and seven female. And Corona encodes this sacrifice, sacrificial number with her day of May 14th. Some more images of Medea. So what is the link between media, 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 and medicine? Its frequency. Medea is broadcasting the illusion of a pandemic. Social media. Madmen, Mada men, priests of the knowledge of Medea. Medmen, the spin doctors of illusion. Does the goddess Cardea represent an infiltration of AI into our karna? Cardea is a biotech company, applying biology as technology, linking up to life, biology-gated transistors. And here we have a digital hydra. Here is the Cardea symbol. Here is the CEO, uh, Michael Heltzen. He, is, he spearheads the digital biology leadership and the strategy at Cardea, bioinformatics, next-gen sequencing, genomics, intracellular communication. This is the uh, chief scientific officer, Kiana Aran, and she describes the CRISPR on graphene. They use graphene I don't even think this person is human. Uh, she works at the Keck Graduate Institute located at Claremont, California, a nod to the Collage de Claremont in Paris, which was founded by the Jesuit, Jesuits in 1563. Here's a picture of the campus. And they also have uh, an undergraduate program called Minerva. Here she is representing Milena with another one representing Galatea, the two Aphrodites. Who is Kek? Kek is the deification of the concept of primordial darkness in the ancient Egyptian Ogdoad cosmology of Hermopolis. Kek's female counterpart was Kauket, and they were called Razor Up of the Light and Razor Up of the Night, respectively. The Egyptians believed that before the world was formed, there was a watery mass of dark, directionless chaos. In this chaos lived the Ogdoad, four frog gods and four snake goddesses of chaos, balance in infinity. Well, Cardea is here to cut that balance. She is the cutter. What is the meaning of Kiana? Kiana means divine in uh, it's the Hawaiian form of the name Diana. And Aran is a male name of Hebrew origin, meaning wild goat. 
The sacrifices offered to Aphrodite Pandemos consisted of white goats. Aran is a man in the book of Genesis. He died in Ur of the Chaldees and was son of Terah, the brother of Abraham, through his son Lot. Haran was the ancestor of the Moabites and the Ammonites, and through his daughter Milcah he was ancestral to the Arameans. Here is Sodom being destroyed. Here is his wife turned to a pillar of salt. So this Cardea chip is consumable. They're developing consumable vaccines. And it uses the Janus graphene. Janus is the gate. Cardea is the hinge. Her power is to open is to open what is shut and shut what is open. Graphite. Graphene is one thin layer of graphite. It's the thinnest material ever, one atom layer thin, the strongest material and still flexible. It is only surface. It's the best thermal conductor, one of the best electric electrical conductors. It is transparent. So ene means monolayer. Graphite from grapho, I write. Graphite is black lead, so you have the Saturn element in there, graphene, to write, graphic, the process of writing or recording, description, originally to scrape, scratch on clay tablets with a stylus, garb, to scratch or carve, garb, carve, carve, carven, to cut, to cut down, slay, to cut out, garve, to scratch, carve, English cognate with graphene, to scratch on clay tablets, to cut meat into pieces or slices, carving, carven, lingers po poetically. One carves meat. It recalls caro, carna, carona, karath, and karagma. To engrave, grafan, to dig, to dig up, engrave, carve, chisel. Graven, the graven image. So, is Cardea to cut our um, our DNA? Is it the cut of the white goddess? Are they cutting a covenant? Very interesting etymology of graphene. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank God. Many thanks. See you next time.